mute or we can mute everybody else except for Appa sure. now. Sure, sure, sure. Hmm. Shall we start the session now? Madam, YouTube started, Madam. YouTube live has started. Okay. Okay. Should we start the session now? Yes, you can. Good evening, everyone. I'm Aparna Badrinarayanan, optometrist at Contact Lens Department, Shankar Netralaya. We have all gathered here today in the memory of Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan on her birthday to celebrate her legacy. Quotes like, Action speaks louder than words, and well done is better than well said, reminds me of Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadeva. She was a woman whose action spoke volumes. Conferences and scientific sessions were something Dr. Rajeshwari was always fond of. She used to take an active part in all these sessions. We, the contact lens team at Shankar Netralaya, will follow her lead to make her proud. She has supported and influenced many lives by being a great mentor, friend, teacher, and a well-wisher. She has been a very important part of Shankar Netralaya that the management readily agreed to conduct the scientific session in her memory. Few quick announcements before we start the session. Participants can view the live program in YouTube and post comments or questions through the chat box. Check the description box of YouTube live streaming page for web links. Participation certificates will be given to the participants who fill in the pretest or registration link. Provide your full name and appropriate email ID for the certificates. E-poster can be commented or questioned against e each poster. Oral paper presenters in Google Meet are requested to switch off their video and keep themselves in mute until their session starts. Before we start the session, kindly register your no name and mail ID in the registration link. I welcome you all to a couple of hours of intense brainstorming. We shall start the session with an invocation song by Ms. Akshya Balakrishnan. She is a graduate student in Elite School of Optometry. She is currently working on her master's thesis in the field of contact lens. She is going to sing one of Dr. Raji's favorite songs. Prabhu Ganapati Paripura Navayurmai Prabhu Ganapati Paripura Navayurmai Prabhu Ganapati 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 Yeah, 
That was truly a treat to our ears, Akshya. Thank you. I now invite Ms. Manju Balakrishnan, optometrist at the contact lens department, to deliver the welcome address. A warm good evening to one and all present here. I take the pleasure in welcoming everyone as we have come together today to celebrate the life of an outstanding achiever, educator, manager, in the realm of contact lens and its specialization, Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan. I feel honored and privileged in welcoming our special chief guest, Dr. Edward S. Bennett, who is widely recognized for his expertise in contact lens and serving as the executive director of Gas Permeable Lens Institute, the educational division of Contact Lens Manufacturers Association. He is currently the vice chair of the contact lens and cornea section of American Optometric Association, a fellow and a diplomat. Welcome, sir. It gives me an immense pleasure in welcoming our panel delegates, Dr. Anita Aravind, specialty contact lens practitioner, Mr. Preetan Kumar, associate optometrist, LB Prasad Eye Institute, Ms. Renu Thomas, assistant professor, Manipal College of Health Professionals, and Mr. Asif Iqbal, Senior Optometrist, Shankar Netralia Medical Research Foundation. I'm also glad to welcome our former principal of Elite School of Optometry, Dr. R. Krishnakumar. I would like to welcome our enthusiastic participants and audience for the day. Last but not the least, a hearty welcome to all our own ever supporting team and management. Thank you, ma'am. Reach high for the stars lie hidden in your soul. Dream deep, for every dream leads to a goal. Raji Ma'am was indeed a star and a great achiever. May I now invite Dr. S. Vishwanathan, HOD of Contact Lens, Optometry and Optical Services to speak a few words about Dr. Rajeshwari. Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan, fondly called as Raji, who headed the contact lens clinic for almost two decades, epitomized leadership, courage, resilience, dedication, perfection, and innovation. We have lost Raji to the hard battle with cancer. She brought in all the best practices and advancements in the field of contact lenses and specialty contact lenses to Shankarnetralia that raised the status of the contact lens clinic at Essen to the numero uno position. Raji graduated from the prestigious Silit School of Optometry, ESO, in 1998 and went ahead to pursue her MPhil and PhD in contact lenses while continuing to serve at Essen. She held a number of first of its kind accolades, including a PhD in the field of specialty contact lenses, Pro's Clinical Fellowship from the Boston Foundation for Sight USA, to becoming the Asia-Pacific Regional President of the Executive Board of the International Association of Contact Lens Educators, IACL. She became a Fellow of the International Association of Contact Lens Educators, FIACL, in 2000, obtained FSLS, a fellowship from the Scleral Lens Education Society in 2014, awarded the first initiated Educator of the Year Award in the field of contact lens in Asia-Pacific region for the year 2014, received the fellowship from the British Contact Lens Association in the year 2014, fellowship from the American Academy of Optometry, FAAO, in 2016, and served as the Asia-Pacific President for IACL. There was never a moment when she did not think of what next. The proudest moment in her life was authoring her first book on troubleshooting and problem solving in contact lens practice, 
which was released during the ESO's International Vision Science and Optometry Conference in 2015 by her revered guru, Mahathriya Ra. She had also authored a chapter on role of contact lens in different environment in a book published on occupational optometry. She had authored a chapter on cornea and contact lens in the book Payments Ophthalmology. After her demise, the cornea, contact lens and refractive therapy section of the American Academy of Optometry has honored Raji with the posthumous diplomat of the CCLRT section. The highest recognition in the field one could possibly ever get right now. This shows the exemplary clinician researcher that Raji was not just within but across the global fraternity. Raji will be missed deeply and her loss is indeed an irreplaceable and irreparable one to the SN family. She will remain an inspiration to many in the personal and professional front. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your memories of her. We will now have a digital representation of Dr. Raji's contribution to Shankar Netravya and the whole contact lens fraternity. <laughs> that should have inspired many of us here. I request Ms. Karpagavalli Subramanian, 
senior optometrist of contact lens department to introduce the oration speaker to our esteemed audience. Good evening all. It's now my great pleasure to introduce one of the most influential optometrists in United States by um, optometric management and was honored as one of the most influential in contact lens in the last 30 years by contact lens spectrum. Yes, is Dr. Edward Bennett. We are very grateful and delighted to have you in this session. Dr. Bennett is currently a professor emeritus at the University of Missouri, St. Louis College of Optometry. He is currently an executive director of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, the Education Division of the Contact Lens Manufacturers Association, and the clinical feature editor for Contact Lens Spectrum. He is on the educational committee of the Global Speciality Lens Symposium, an editorial review board member for review of optometry, an expert contributor to allaboutvision.com, and an editorial board member for review of cornea and contact lens. He is a past chair of the contact lens and cornea section, Council of American Optometric Association and a diplomat, and a past chair of cornea, contact lenses and refractive technologies section of the American Academy of Optometry. He has authored over 200 publications, including 14 texts and lectured at over 340 scientific and continuing education education symposia. He is a recipient of both Dr. Joseph Dallas Award and Leonardo da Vinci Award. He also received the Achievement Award and the Legends Award, the Global Speciality Lens Symposium Award of Excellence and the National Keratoconus Foundation Ambassador Award, Award for Excellence in Optometric Education the University of Houston College of Optometry Award for distinguished research on cornea and contact lenses. I warmly welcome you, Dr. Bennett, and brighten up our knowledge in indication and fitting of corneal GP design. Welcome. Thank you. Let me see if I can get a presentation up here. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the button. Aparna, you, you stop presenting, then we can see the present now. Okay. Okay. Let's see. I apologize. I had it a minute ago, and now I'm not seeing the change presentation button. So it will be visible now. You can just move the mouse a little bit, the cursor, like we did the other day, and um, you will be able to see that present now in the bottom. Should be present, Doctor Bennett. Should be present. Um, it was below earlier below. Now I'm not seeing it. Uh, just move your mouse a little bit. You will see that in the bottom of the uh, screen. If you move your uh, cursor, if you move the cursor a little bit, it will come into view. Uh, uh, I apologize. It, it was it was there till just a few minutes ago. Now I don't. I unmuted myself and then. Um, uh, okay, when you muted yourself in the same band only to your right, it will be seen. Now, can you see the mute? Uh, boy, sorry. Oh, that's, a, that's no problem. You can just uh, move the uh, cursor a little bit. You know, I don't know what happened to it. I had the three options and now they are gone. So I apologize. Uh, oh, here, got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 How's this? You are able to share? Um, you have to click on that picture. 
you see that picture? So that isn't showing up, huh? And you have to click the present now. There are, there are uh, your option is showing as your entire screen. Okay. Please click on that. Yes, we can see your screen. We have it? Yes. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. I apologize for the delay. It's so well organized. I want to first dedicate this presentation to Dr. Raji. Uh, I think that it is very evident that she has meant so much to so many. And whereas we didn't have the opportunity to get together in August, um, I'll forever keep the email that I received from her over the last two years. And it was a very easy decision and, and a privilege to accept this invitation to give a keynote address at this meeting in her honor and on her birthday. So let's start with, let's lens use today versus yesterday. And my history of corneal GP lenses goes back forever. Uh, 53 years of wearing. Uh, as a student, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Irvin Borish, and he really, I owe my career to him. And he, when I was investigating as a student, several materials for him, one of them was what I consider to be the first viable GP material, and that was the Polycon lens, and, and I got hooked. And then I had the idea to publish a text on RGP lenses, and it got rejected by every publisher. Uh, one of the publishers, I remember the letter said, we don't think it's a good idea, and who's ever heard of Ed Bennett? So I went to Dr. Borish and I said, would you write a chapter on bifocal uh, RGPs and he said, sure, Ed, put his name on the table of contents, send it to his publisher, and it was approved. And then for me, the rest was history. And the greatest professional decision I made was two years later, becoming the executive director of the GP Lens Institute. And it's, it's meant to be the, a very comprehensive uh, educational uh, program and resource center. So we, we hope that uh, we accomplish that and continue to do so. But weren't GP lenses supposed to be obsolete by 2010? Well, I, was, I remember being to the Scottish Optometric Association in 1993 when Professor Nathan Efren said they would be extinct by 2000, later said 2010. On your left, you actually wrote the obituary in 2010, but then several years later uh, ended up concluding that it's likely that rigid lenses will remain as a viable uh, form of vision correction. So he admitted defeat. And they are doing fine. This was back in 2010 on your left is the International Conduct Lens Prescribing article that uh, Phil Morgan does every year for Conduct Lens Spectrum. And you know, 10 years ago, they had 9% of fits and refits internationally out of 24,000. And then this past January, uh, again, similar number, they had 14% being GPs, 11% spherical, 3% ortho K, and about one in seven of GP lenses fit internationally are sclerals. So GPs are doing fine. In the U.S., they, I go back to 1996 and Dr. Joe Barr, he indicated that 12 to 15 percent of wearers were wearing RGPs in the U.S. Uh, today, and this is as of January, 11 percent, 9 percent GPs, 2 percent hybrids. So they're still viable. One in nine are being fit into GPs. Now, what type of GPs are they being fit into? Well, 75 percent. In fact, if you count ortho K as a corneal lens and you have 83 percent are corneal lenses and that's why we're having this conversation today. But sclerals, again, up there about one in eight, and then hybrids. Well, what about the comfort issue? Oh, boy. Well, the most common cause for discontinuation, as we know, is discomfort. And I've dedicated, the funny thing is, I've dedicated my life to this issue, but you know, none of it had to do with scleral lenses. Scleral lenses came along and, and that automatically changed uh, things. And I, I take absolutely no credit for that. 
But the areas I did look at, and you can put scleral lenses under lens design, you know, we've done studies looking at presentation of GP lenses. We've done a study looking at uh, topical anesthetic use and found that um, it was significantly better received. Subjects who had a topical anesthetic immediately prior to the lens uh, being applied felt better about their adaptation, about their success, and were more successful than those who didn't. And likewise, those who received a presentation that was very positive toward GPs were more likely to be successful than those who did not. So I'll look at a couple of these factors. One is presentation. As I mentioned, how you present turned out to be an, a significant factor in patient success in, in a study we did over 20 years ago. If you have people that really react to you know, drops being put in their eyes or lit version, uh, you know, they're gonna be people a little bit more challenging to adapt but the key factors are not using negative phrases, not using discomfort, pain, intolerance, but just indicate these are smaller lenses than soft lenses, so they move more on the eye. Therefore, there will be some lens awareness and lid sensation initially, which will go away over time. And we've adopted GP, not RGP. We know they're rigid, but it just sounds better, I guess. But we also know significance of good initial vision is very critical. It's important every time we can provide them with good vision right off the bat, uh, that provides a wow factor and tells patients, gives patients the key benefit of GP lenses. And that can be accomplished by empirical fitting. Today, empirical fitting is very easy. We have very reproducible designs. They have ultra-thin technologies, standard peripheries, all these things that you know and Dr. Raji knew very, very well. And you, you can empirically fit most GP lenses, spherical, bitoric, multifocal, hybrid, and coronary reshaping designs all lend themselves today to empirical fitting because of how reproducible they can be manufactured. And this is a great psychological benefit to the patient. We looked at this, uh, I write a GP update article every October, and this is going to come out next month. And I pulled the readership in terms of what percent do they fit empirically, or what, you know, do they fit empirical or diagnostic in each of these categories? And you can tell about four and five fit torics empirically, about three fourths fit multifocals, the great majority fit sphericals, Orthokeratology about 58%, but that's going up. Likewise with hybrids. Hybrids now uh, are being promoted to be fit empirical. The only ones that really aren't are those fit to irregular corneas, and in particular sclerals, until corneal scleral topographers become more popular. Then uh, orthokeratology is one of the big advances in corneal lenses, and we know that the risk of myopia uh, and, and the side effects that can occur, particularly as you look at myopic maculop maculopathy, we do need to try to limit this, basically this epidemic that we have worldwide. We have three ways that we can do it that we're using today in overnight orthokeratology, peripheral plus uh, lens power and then uh, personal plus soft lenses and atropine. And you can see just a, a perfect, perfectly fit GP lens in Ortho-K. Well, Ortho-K really has numerous benefits and it is experiencing more and more of kind of a resurgence or rebirth today. Uh, it does have a, a much quicker adaptation than other GP lenses. I used to find with kids that they could adapt within a few nights. The first night they put them on, they, there'd be some awareness, but by the second, third night, they were fine. And it's because these lenses fit uh, fairly tight. They don't move very much. They're a little bit larger than standard corneal designs. So that comfort hasn't been a huge issue at all. Easy to become certified. It's been found by Jeff Walleen and others that the great majority of kids successfully adapt to and can handle 
ortho K lenses. And actually, the incidence of microbial keratitis is has been found to be identical to extended wear. So that isn't an issue either. And of course, they can be fit empirically with, with very good first fit success. We've looked at a, a, a number of different designs and a number of studies. And one of them was the SMART study, which was the three-year study. And one of the key results of the SMART study, maybe the key result, was that 80% of the eyes were successfully fit empirically with the first lens. So we had first fit success empirically of 80%. We now know how it works that it all pertains to the peripheral retina. If we have uh, the traditional peripheral hyperopia or blurring in the peripheral retina with conventional contact lenses or glasses, that is in fact a go sign for eye growth. But if we use an ortho K design, which uh, because of its kind of unique reverse geometry and what's going on paracentral and mid peripherally, then we bring that shell in and we create a myo myopic defocus, and that is in fact a stop sign for eye growth. Now I have to I have to show you this. Uh, I, I was moderating a session at at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium, and one of the papers presented the investigator indicated that his ortho K design could reduce myopia by nine diopters. And I thought knowing that these lenses reshape the eye and there's only a limited amount that you can reduce. I, I came up with the only thing I ever put my name on a lens that the one lens I think that can reduce myopia by nine diopters. I call it the Bennett lens. It basically takes the cornea and shoves it all the way back to the retina. So that's the only way I know of to reduce that much. Well, how much do we want to reduce it by? Well, Jeff Wallin and others have said we need to reduce myopia progression by 50%. That would be clinically meaningful. And if you take somebody who at age eight is a one diopter myope, then there'll be a five diopter myope at age 16, unless we have a myopia control device in front of them. So what our goal then would be is that they would become no greater than a three diopter myope, and then we'd have that 50% control. Does Ortho-K do that? Yes, it, it really does, or it really comes close to it. There's been a lot of studies and several since these, but the amount of myopia control does approximate 50% with Ortho-K. What about multifocals in 2020? And I, I will tell you that as a uh, probably a 25 year wear of aspheric GP multifocals, uh, the vision you receive at all distances is very good, very comparable to glasses uh, with the benefit of not having glasses uh, on. And, and a lot of patients don't want to wear glasses that have been contact lens wearers. And, you know, some of them just simply don't look very good in glasses. So that's uh, just not the optimum option for them. What about monovision? Well, it's had traditionally good success. And I will say whenever I did fit monovision, and it was always kind of a last resort for me, I always prescribed over spectacles for these people. So when they'd be out driving, they would see optimally out of both eyes at distance. That's almost a requirement if they're going to do monovision. But there's been such advances in multifocal designs that it, it should be a, a secondary option, if, if at all. We've done several studies looking at it. Uh, my former resident, Jeff Johnson, uh, did a comparison where they wore an aspheric GP multifocal for six weeks, and then they wore monovision for six weeks or vice versa. And like most studies with both soft and GP lenses, around three and four preferred the multifocal. One of the studies I'm most proud of, and, and I, we were so blessed for the years that we had Ben Gulashrinderainen and on our faculty, and, and I, I was really blessed because I, he had several outstanding uh, individuals who had been at elite school who came uh, and worked uh, with Bengu at our school. And I had the pleasure of having two of them working with me and they're both outstanding, um, Sandy Subramaniam and Aruna Rajagopalan. Aruna um, helped with 
and really ran this um, study, which I was uh, really excited about. We had 32 subjects, eight were GP monovision, eight were soft bifocals, eight were aspheric GP molecules, and eight were progressive edition lenses, spectacle lenses. And Aruna ran a whole series of vision tests on these individuals. And what we found, and high is good as we look at this chart, this is high contrast acuity, this is low contrast acuity, that you can see in the GP mole focals were very, very similar to the progressive edition lenses. Um, the next were soft bifocals and the least performing were monovision. And that was likewise with contrast sensitivity. Again, the higher values um, have better contrast sensitivity function and that is once again, the GP bifocals and the progressive addition spectacle lenses. So what we concluded was that GP wearers exhibited the highest contrast sensitivity at all frequencies for the three types of contact lenses that were used and, and basically were significantly better from a visual standpoint performance. Now, my former resident, Jeff Johnson, who, who ultimately left optometry and became a financial analyst, so I, I must have had some sort of impact on him uh, in a negative way, but he, he is the person that we use at Contact Lens Spectrum to do all our surveying. And every year he um, provides an extensive survey and asks for practitioners' preferences. Um, and for presbyopes wearing contact lenses, we're, we're seeing that trend now where the multifocal lenses are their go-to lens for the presbyope. Whereas monovision, it's only about one in six and spectacles less than one in 10. And the design that's really had a tremendous impact today is, uh, is aspheric designs. And they now have the ability to have higher ads. I'm a living example of that. I wear a high ad front surface aspheric. And in fact, to be effective, they do have to shift uh, some or translate on the eye for us to be able to see as well as we do at near. And candidates for aspheric GP mole focals, really about anybody. I think that one of the key rule outs for aspherics would be in fact pupil size. If they would have a large pupil, and you can see that over here on the right, um, it, being center distance designs, which I love, I love the fact that you're really not compromising distance vision or, or very minimally. Um, you can tell as you go into larger pupil and you get further and further away from the center, particularly if you're like night driving and you have a six millimeter pupil and it dilates, then you're, you're going to have problems. Fortunately, very few presbyopes have large pupils, and therefore front surface aspherics are a good option for about everybody, especially people who want good vision. The way that they should be fit is to have good centration and limited movement. And this would be an example of a good fitting empirical design on a patient. And again, it's, it's a great design to start with. It's fit empirically, and once you get confident with that, you can fit any sort of presbyopic design. Troubleshooting is very easy. If it drops, as you see here, if it falls, then you know, they're going to have difficulty and you need to select a steeper base curve. Likewise, if they don't have enough ad power in the lens, just communicate with your laboratory and day to day, they'll be able to incorporate more ad Maybe they'll just do it on the non-dominant eye, but you know, your lab consultant is your best. We also have very good post-refractive surgery designs. Now that we've done front surface aspheric multifocals where the, the ad power is on the front, that means you can do whatever you want to do on the back. And that can include a reverse geometry design so that you can match uh, a GP lens with an oblate corneal shape as you have in many surgery patients. A regular cornea, yes, um, as you can look about 29% of keratoconics have nipple cones, which means that they're 
Uh, they have small, uh, rel relatively well-centered cones, and another 44% have like intermediate-sized or oval cones. All of those people can potentially be fit into a corneal GP design. Certainly, the nipples can go um, into a small GPs as we see here, and you can, I like to strive for three-point touch, and I'll use the collect philosophy, and I will begin on steep K with my base curve radius equal to the steep K reading, and then I'll go flatter until I achieve this type of fit, or you can just follow the manufacturer's fitting philosophy. It is important, however, to use a high to a relatively high DK lens material because these individuals like to wear their lenses every waking hour and sometimes uh, some non-waking hours as well. Intralimbals, which are your 11 to 11 five millimeter lenses, are also a, a viable option, particularly in your oval cones. And I've always felt like, yes, I think the scleral lenses have become the go-to lens in irregular corneas, but don't forget about corneals and especially starting with corneals when they have uh, relatively small and relatively well-centered um, apexes to their cones. And then finally, what about bitorix? Well, there, there are several empirical methods of fitting bitorix that certainly I know we use in the U.S. and we actually have on our website for the GP Lens Institute. Mandel Moore, of course, is very, very easy where you can just insert the K values and the spectacular X, and then it gives you the base curves and powers. And I had Dr. Borish as my professor when I was uh, in school, and when he got done talking about bitorics, I, I just figured I will never fit a bitoric in my life, but uh, I soon found out how easy they are and uh, how great they are when patients have a moderate to high amount of corneal tericity. So here you can see when you input the K values and the refraction, then it will calculate, you know, the base curves and the powers. And I think this is, it doesn't get any easier than this. And your labs are very good at being able to provide the other parameters. You can also use optical crosses and you can put the same information on an optical cross, their refractive powers and their K values. And then the first step is to vertex it to the corneal plane, and you can see that. Then use the Mandel Moore fit factor, and that is going about three quarters of diopter flatter in the steep meridian and a quarter diopter flatter in the flat meridian. And all you do, or what it'll do for you, is add plus power to compensate for that. And there you have your powers and your base curves. So really quite simple using these types of methods. We have our calculator, the GPLI Toric and Spherical Lens Calculator uh, on our website, and it, it shows more graphically. You know, it'll have the K values and the refraction. It will then give you the tier lens powers created uh, by this program, and then you will correct for that and it will give you the final powers and base curves. It will also give you some additional information. And this is what you'll want to order in terms of base curves, powers, and it'll also say, well, the difference in base curve is two and a quarter diopters. The difference in lens powers are two and a quarter diopters. So you have a spherical power effect by toric design, which means this lens can rotate on the eye all at once without changing uh, affecting vision whatsoever. So what's the bottom line? Well, GP lenses will continue to represent an important component of successful contact lens practice today and well into the future. The continuing introduction of innovative large diameter, reverse geometry, corneal reshaping, and molecular designs will meet the needs of both young and old patients who desire good quality vision at all distances. And again, I really want to thank all of you for allowing me to give the privilege of having this presentation uh, on the day that we honor somebody who is very, very special to GP lenses, contact lenses in general, 
and to our profession. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bennett. It is truly a very fascinating journey of the GP lenses. And we are privileged to hear it from the master himself. And uh, we are also happy to see the journey of the young, smart Dr. Bennett then and now. I would also like to mention that when I wrote to him asking about his availability for this session, he had replied early in the morning immediately at 6 a.m. All of us here from the Medical Research Foundation extend our gratitude for your wonderful gesture and agreeing to be a part of this Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan Memorial Oration. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Dr. Bennett, for enlightening us with your talk. Let's now move on to the next session. Ms. Sutapa Purkit, Optometrist of Contact Lens Department, will now introduce our keynote speaker. A brainstorming scientific evening to all of you. It is an honor for me to introduce our today's keynote speaker, Dr. Krishn R. Krishnakumar. Our Krishna Kumar did his undergraduation, MPhil, and doctorate programs from Elite School of Optometry. He also possesses fellowship in British Dispensing Opticians and Masters in Psychology. He was working with Shankar Netralaya and Elite School of Optometry with various responsibilities. He was also principal of Elite School of Optometry for 16 years and was heading the Occupational Optometry Department for six years at Shankar Netralaya. Dr. KK, as he is popularly known in Shankar Netralaya and in optometry communities, has 32 papers in credit in various national and international peer-reviewed journals. He has also authored two books in optometry and was also an editor and chapter contributor in occupational optometry books. Dr. KK is presently working as a freelance optometrist and educationist as well as a visiting occupational optometrist and faculty member at Shankar Netralaya and Elite School of Optometry respectively. We are very much thankful to Dr. KK for becoming a part of our scientific session. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. KK to introduce integrated practice model of optometrists in India. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sudipta, for the nice introduction. Uh, I think you can you stop sharing so that I can share? Yes, so that, so that yes. So you can directly share, sir. No, not a problem. I'll do my way. <laughs> You're seeing now? Hello. We can see the screen. The presentation is uh, yet to be seen. Yeah, we can see now. <clears throat> Thank you for the nice introduction. And after listening to Bennett, I was wondering actually, I think you should have kept my talk before Bennett. Uh, uh, but anyway, I will try to match him to some extent, at least 25 percentage. Um, uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me to be the keynote speaker alongside uh, with the you know, stalwart in contact lens. And uh, the talk, talk is, will be on integrated practice model for optometrists in India. And uh, it is indeed the uh, uh, right way to dedicate this talk, like Bennett said, to this wonderful clinician, researcher, and uh, 
um, uh, and academician teaching. So, so she has already you know, demonstrated how integrated an optometric practice would have been and be successful if you do all three components effectively within the time allotted rather than saying time is not there. Uh, I think, uh, so I also take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, some of the key people who supported for making this uh, presentation. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Ramesh, um, HD of Manipal Academy of Higher Education for providing with the, his experience of um, um, EBP, which I will be talking later in his um, university, as well as Oculus uh, supported by Erasmus and uh, Ms. Janani Optometrist for helping to enhance this PowerPoint slide. I think I will be talking um, a various aspect of why we have to be you know, initiating this enhanced complementary integrative optometric care in India only to benefit the patient care and patients effectively. So I will be touching upon the gaps and try to see how we have to fill these gaps uh, with a proper approach both from the educational perspective as well as the practice perspective. Integrative means bringing all parts together, literally, or unify, or to join with something else, or to make part of a larger unit. But in terms of integrative health, even before we think about integrative eye care, it is interesting to know that the integrative health means well-being of a body, mind, and spirit that reflects aspects of the individual community and population. It is affected by individual biological factors as well as psychological and social factors around him. But more to it, an integrative healthcare system, which that involves active participation of the individual in the healthcare team in applying a broad spectrum of preventive and therapeutic approach only with the goal that we have to do ensure the patient's well-being at large. Since our focus is related to eye care, in the next 15 minutes, I will share some of my thoughts of integrated eye care specific to the roles of an optometrist as the practitioner can play in an integrated system. We all know optometry today our optometrists today play a huge role on three levels of care. One is the primary, secondary, and third is the tertiary. Each one, without going into the detail, each one has got a role they play as an integrated, or each one play a collaborative role alongside with an ophthalmologist. Whether it is adequate or not is only the question. There is some amount of integrated optometry, ophthalmologist, um, no interaction for better patient care. The question comes here whether it is adequate or not. There is no doubt as to whether the integrated care is important or not because already we are in the path. The need for integrated models of eye care is not debatable at all. Any model of that kind is designed to promote collaborative practices for the purposes of improving eye and vision care access and quality. It improves efficiency within the medical establishment to facilitate coordinated patient-centered care across multiple providers in a time when the increasing prevalence of chronic conditions, we do have today chronic visual impairments and age-related diseases, which require more value-conscious healthcare system. So there is an important need for this integrated model. The question is how to make it very comprehensive and complete and ensure the best care to the patient. Now, however, we say, as I said, there is a gap between this uh, two, actually, this integration model itself. Uh, more to say, though it should not be told as a disintegrated system, but system required a lot of refinement to ensure a better enhanced patient care. There are n number of gaps. We have to fill many of these gaps. 
But I would like to point out three key points which probably take care of most of these gaps which is at present existing in the existing integrated model. One is the lack of accountability. Whether you take a primary care level or in the secondary care or the tertiary care level. Look at the primary care and secondary care. There is no protocol existing. There is no uniformity existing. There is no standardization existing. And therefore, there is no referral criteria existing. So the uniformity and standardization of the care to enhance the better integrated model, it's still lacking in our system. Therefore, there is no accountability. In a tertiary care, we had, do have a different kind of system wherein the amount of accountability is predominantly is in the hands of ophthalmologists, not in the hands of optometrists. So to say, I strongly feel there is very less amount of cognitive demand in decision making and hardly we see a collaboration in the care process of optometrists in such a system. So, of course, if we want to achieve it, of course, it's not going to happen overnight. There are a lot of coordinated effect is required to deal with it, to interact with the stakeholders and try to achieve it. And we are in the right stage where we can do this thing effectively. So the integrated mod model I define as optometry and ophthalmology working together to provide convenient, competent patient care in both surgical, medical co-management. And each profession has its strengths and limitation when it comes to a patient philosophy, first philosophy, where the care provided by one side can nicely complement that of the other. The main advantage of integrated eye care is working off or one another strength to accentuate the positives of overall patient care. This is told by Chris Freeman, who is a practitioner by himself uh, in an integrated model, and he saw the benefit. And we are also seeing the benefit. We have to see the purpose for which this integrated model should be delivered today effectively. Now, how to achieve this you know, aspect by filling the gap and to make it more effective? There are three aspects which I could think of and immediately to be done. One, the integrated, a complementary nature of optometrist and ophthalmologist patient care. In no more routine, non-complementary optometric care in an integrated system. The second thing is how to ensure our care also more evidence-based. It should not be more by our own experience alone. Of course, experience counts, but evidence is count more than the experience alone. And third is, how to integrate all three facets so that you ensure better patient care, research, academic, and um, what is so important in terms of the clinical care. As we have seen how Raji demonstrated that possibility, how Bennett is demonstrating that possibility today. And how to start and where to start is very, very critical. I think in India, we should see that if you want to enhance the um, no integrated optometry model, enhance the better patient care, optometric care, and eye care, then we need to do a few of these groundwork. One, try to involve as a practitioner into promotive and preventive care. Today, I don't see that is happening effectively in the, in the sense in an integrated model. The second thing is at primary care in a real sense, playing an independent diagnostic role, important of glass prescription, because with NABH around, there are places where even glass prescription are not allowed by the optometrist. Thanks that with a new bill coming up, all these things will be sorted out. Vision care management, referring for further diagnostic tests and appropriate specialty in indicated cases. And it is also important with the technology evolving that every clinic and every independent practice and the uh, practices where you're teaming up with people, teleconsultation should become a norm so that the integrated model will become more strengthened and patient will get easily without traveling a longer distance, the best integrated model care. And the important aspect is many places, the counseling in part of the diseases, prognosis, treatment, surgeries, which has been advised by the ophthalmologist, the role an optometrist plays is huge and humongous, but we have to see how we can tap this thing to ensure better integrated model. I think if we can work on to this, I think probably we are trying to achieve it. The reason why I'm telling this, 
at this, this is the right juncture for one reason, because already Allied and Health Professional Bill 2018 is gone to the Standing Committee and Standing Committee already has given the recommendation to the Ministry and it is only a matter of time it is going to get implemented the first time in India. There are two key aspects that we have to note in this bill. One, what is the definition of optometry? And second, what is the job de description? And both has got an international standard. One follows the World Council of Optometry definition. The second, ILO's, uh, India is an ILO member, International Labor Organization member, one of the key members. Now they are following the international standard classification occupation code 2261, which describes the job description of an optometrist. So that we see there is a huge role an optometrist can play an integrated eye care system effectively and within the legal framework. Now, that one gap can be filled effectively, but we do have a challenge within our own thing. The one challenge which we do have is, the second challenge we do have is the eminence overlooking the evidences. So, unless we move from this eminence to evidence-based practice, we are going to have a big drawback contributing to this integrated model. For example, some of the gaps which we can look at, the lack of awareness about the EBP itself in, among, the, among the practitioner, among the faculties who are teaching the students, and the standardization questionable in the faculty training, teaching and clinical practice. All these things are not well integrated to ensure evidence-based practice become a part of the norm. Uh, probably we have to look, the practitioner should be attending a lot of workshops, try to enhance the uh, nuances and steps involved in EBP, and the school system try to incorporate right from the earliest of optometric education to fill this gap. Of course, it is not without obstacles. The biggest obstacle is in the our mindset, the attitude towards it, and time which we always feel it is not available with us, and not thinking outside the scope of practice and always feel the knowledge to access this quality of available evidences is very, very less. Of course, these obstacles are need to be sincerely looked at and should overcome for better optometric care. Now, EVP in optometric practice is nothing new. Already in Western countries, it has been started. And we are, some of our own people have started thinking about it. And there are guidelines that already exist. I'm going to share some, one guide, one such guideline from American Academy of Optometry which talks EBP means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidences from systemic research. Of course, it is the biggest challenge with exponential increase of knowledge available today with literatures available today, how to properly filter out. There is a strategy, there is the steps involved, there is a lot of websites supporting those initiatives. We can always use it whether you are a practitioner, whether you are a faculty member, you can work towards it. The simplest way, a PICO model is one such model, though I understand from some of the experts, but it is not adequate in all scenarios, especially optometric scenarios, that we can follow the PICO model. We can use some amount of modification and ensure that this, right, this helps us to ask a question, fundamental clinical question, which need to be looked for the evidences. That will be the second step to look how to locate the best evidences. The best evidences are available in different sources. We can classify sources as secondary sources, and we can classify sources as primary sources, and also classify whether this evidence is adequately adequate enough or not, and which level of evidence it is, so that we know what we are providing is a stronger evidence or it is weaker evidence. Now, how to locate the best evidences? Try to look for journals which try to talk in terms of evidence-based healthcare, systemic review. We can look at a lot of clinical practice guidelines today. It's all available, free, open access to show, see some of the evidences for the questions you have. Maybe that's the easiest way to approach apart from you yourself doing step-by-step -step achieving the best uh, evidences. But don't stop with that. Once you have some material with you as to those kind of articles or manuscripts or from clinical guidelines, try to critically look into whether this adequate any evident or not in terms of validity, in terms of clinical relevance and application to the patient, 
whether the patient can really utilize it, whether you could afford to do it, patient can afford to do it. All these aspects we can try to put together and see how it can be integrated in uh, these findings into uh, with clinical expertise and see how the patient's needs can be met through this. And the last part is relook into whether the systematic approach we do is adequately um, adequate enough and it seeks ways to improve, always try to time and again look into this material. These are the simple steps that each one of us can follow, try to take guidance from various sources. In fact, today there are material websites that are available to look into web-based information on, on how these evaluations are already existing there. You can try to look into it, but still you look all these materials with a critical look so that we know in your place, in your culture, in your uh, space, whether these clinic, whether it is applicable or not. So that is about the practice, but we have to shift this ensuring for future, if you want to create more of clinician who can easily fit into an integrated model, we have to ensure that faculty members to get trained. Now, today there are at least three places I could account, no, to show that where this training is possible. In India, also I understand some of the universities and institution has come forward to teach and inculcate this to the faculty members. Of course, we know there is a biggest challenge in, in terms of attitude of the faculty members. We can always show that we can overcome it by proper, uh, no, uh, the counseling so that ensuring this lack of time is need not be a critical factor to be worried about. Now, how to integrate this EBP in our outcome curriculum is a natural question. Of course, I've seen many of these Western universities have been inculcated. Recently, I saw it has been inculcated in Australia, where um, they are both in QUT and Melbourne, where they are giving this as part of the master's program. Interestingly, we have an Indian setup in Manipal University, they have already inculcated into their master's program as one semester course, as well as they embedded this through the journal club for various courses in the undergraduate, like clinical examination and vision system, ocular disease, binocular vision and contact lens. And they are trying to see that is a lot of meaningful impact it is creating among the students. And this then Dr. Ramesh says that there is um, no the clinical decision making become easier for uh, patients as they see through their clinical portfolios. So I see there is a hope, of course, we have to really see how these students after passing out and graduate and when get into the community, how they are implementing that for a long time. So EBP optometric treating strategies are very critical. I'm not going to get into the detail. Very important to ensure, try to give them some basic information, how to go about understanding the research methods, inculcate the ethics and peer review in the years, early part of your education, and also try to teach them how to critically read the material, help them to ask questions, try to look every time when you do a clinical practice under you, if you have a student, try to show the patient, show the student that there is an evidence with under which you are performing this you know, uh, management to this patient and effective clinical mentoring whenever you do it, ensure the students have been encouraged to ask questions, not don't give the answer, try to ask them to go about how to go about finding out the answer through proper literature search so that you are trying to inculcate the importance of EBP to all the students. To put it in a not recommendation to the schools of optometry today, if you want to start, the simple step which I would like to start suggest is some places they say you better incorporate this one towards the end. So I would like to suggest let it be introduced as a course um, in the first year itself, or at least through a CME kind of it, try to inculcate that knowledge in the first year that everything you're going to do it through some evidences. And try to do this vertical and horizontal integration in the early years so that they know why they are doing and how this is going to be really beneficial. The later part demonstrate through a few examples and application in the clinical practice from the second year and encourage students to start applying the steps involved in EBP for sample clinical questions given by the faculty members. So encourage students as they get into the clinic to apply the EBP with the, under the supervision and this can be assessed through the continuous process and you can ensure that if the infrastructures are adequate in terms of accessibility to all the resource, relevant resource material, 
maybe an indian setup i understand university has got that advantage but uh, the institution also can try to do to the key journals which are very important can be helped so that students should can access to all those things and high speed internet connection are two essential aspect which in terms of infrastructure is the only investment now the schools on the association also should realize that ebp can't stand alone in institution setup unless and until it becomes a part of the competency matrix and so ebp into the competence matrix i think here we have representation of uh, dr anita is here she can take this up how to enhance the existing competency matrix for entry level optometrists um, you can try to see that this skill of ebp should become a part of it and also try for the schools of optometry you can look at how to integrate the basic science into clinical science how to inculcate this vertical and horizontal integration in the first two years along with B and ebp so that the integrating ebp into clinical practice and mentoring become even more easier as we do all this um, around the works now today there is a new educational policy has come in 2020 in india the key aspect which the policy talks they didn't talk about allied health science and medicines exclusively but the key aspect that we have to gain out of it there is a huge opportunity not only integrating within your own eye care field but also integrating with other fields so that you can bring in lot of values into your patient care i think this should be uh, taken as an opportunity with a new educational policy coming into force and the last aspect which i feel and the best example we do have it in own um, many of us in and around integrating academic research and clinical care as a clinician try to see that you contribute in some way in the research contribute in some way in academics if you do it there are huge number of advantages you have i think there are stay up to date you will be staying up to date without effort the evidences for best practice you will not take any input without critically appraising those thing before even putting to practice so that the patient gets the maximum benefit so i would like to share one of the you know uh, input given by dr rashima who is also doing all these three aspects as a clinician as a researcher and as, as an academician and she says what is the advantage we are clinician we are able to look at the aspects of work related needs anything new to be explored we wear the hat of the researcher and whatever the results of research we understand its plus and minuses and incorporate that into practice and also make efforts to teach students so they do not be a bookworm they will be updated with technology driven evidence based practice i think that is what we are going to gain the maximum especially people who are in the system of integrated model we should ensure that you have to translate and play a huge role um, to the extent possible in your system and to end i would like to make this statement by one of the optometrists a practicing optometrist gonzales who reiterate the importance quotes as healthcare professional we should be ready to accept that our beliefs are not more important than facts moreover the wider our experience the more powerful our beliefs might be and whether we are more clinically oriented or research oriented we need to bear in mind that science makes no effort to confirm beliefs or hypotheses instead it attempts to reject any potential explanation until there is one that cannot be rejected and therefore might be linked to the observation we made this will be an important aspect in anyone's serving clinical practice and code i think with this i would like to reiterate that integrated complementary optometrist ophthalmology patient care is a need of the hour integrating the evidence based into a practice and integrating along with side with your clinical care the research and academic pursuit will be a best approach for enhancing our existing integrated optometry practice model thank you very much for patient listening thank you sir that was indeed an aptly chosen topic for this occasion dr rajeshwari was also practicing integrated approach to her contact lens practice with this we conclude the inaugural session 
and proceed towards the scientific session. A kind reminder to all the participants, kindly register your name and mail ID in the registration link. I would like to inform everyone that the e-abstract book is available in the link in the description box. Dr. Anuradha Narayanan, Principal of Elite School of Optometry and Dr. Rashima Ashokan, Head of Occupational Optometry Services and Assistant Professor at Elite School of Optometry will now take over the scientific session. Thank you, Aparna. Here comes the exciting scientific paper sessions. To give our audience a brief about this, when Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan memorial oration was conceived, Ms. Akila, Director Administration of Medical Research Foundation, had suggested awarding the best scientific paper presentations and having known Raji's keen interest in appreciating research initiatives, the entire team welcomed the idea. Those abstracts that were received for ESO's International Vision Science and Optometry Conference, EVOC 2020, and selected by Raji herself under the contact lens category was shortlisted. There were 30 abstracts out of those 17 were identified for e-posters and five were selected for today's oral presentation. Over to you, Rashima. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I welcome you all for the scientific session of uh, oral presentation today. Uh, hope everyone have enjoyed uh, listening to the, seeing the e-posters which are available in the website. Uh, for today's presentation, we have a uh, five presentations so each will be presented for seven minutes and i'll be giving a warning alarm at the end of six minutes so that you can just wrap up and close it by seven minutes so we'll have uh, time for questions uh, there are no restrictions for the slides so you can prepare as many slides and you can present it but make sure that you finish it within the time period um, the question and answer sessions uh, are actually uh, restricted to the last so we will have all the presenters at the end and we can ask the questions at the end so along with me i have uh, dr anita and uh, dr aishwarya for evaluating the oral presentations so let us start with the first so for the first presentation it is uh, mr usman Neiman. he's from nagar school of optometry and he is going to present on efficacy of silicon hydrogen Bandage contact lenses after trans epithelial photorefractive therapy. Thank you, Rashima. Slides. Yes. Slides are uh, visible, Rashima. Yes, it is. I'm starting the timer also. Uh, dedication to Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan with the gratitude and in our fond, <coughs> fond memories. Uh, uh, the to topic is efficacy of silicon hydrogel bandage contact lenses after trans epithelial photorefractive keratectomy. TPRK. Financial disclosure none. Introduction. Uh, Transepithelial photorefractive keratectomy uh, is a new modification of conventional PRK uh, system. Uh, it is said to be safe and effective procedure uh, for correction of mild to moderate myopia. It is because it maintains the biomechanics of cornea. Limitations of surgery is uh, post-operative pain and delayed visual recovery when epithelial healing occurs. 
after tprk bandage contact lenses are generally prescribed this contact lenses work as a mechanical barrier uh, for the friction forces of eyelids and exposed nerves uh, to the exposed nerves of the cornea reducing the traumatic damage pain discomfort and promote reepithelialization of cornea purpose of study is to compare the efficacy of two silicon hydrogel lenses as bandage contact lenses with dk by t difference of 50 following trans epithelial photo refractive keratectomy study reviewed for our uh, study had also said that silicon hydrogel contact lenses can be considered to be the better choice as bandage contact lenses methodology it is a prospective double blinded observational study conducted in february to september 2018 30 patients in the study were enrolled followed the tenets of declaration for helensky informed written consents were taken post surgery to one of the eye comfil uh, comfilcon a and to other eye the fanfilcon a was uh, uh, inserted as in bandage contact lens Comfilcon A, which is uh, by the trade name of Biofinity from Cooper Vision, had a DK by T of one sixty, water content forty eight percent, and modulus of point eight was chosen. And uh, from same company with the uh, trade name of Avira Vitality, DK by T of one one ten, water content fifty five percent, and modulus point six was chosen for the study. both of them being the third generation uh, silicon hydrogel contact lenses inclusion criteria uh, patients who underwent bilateral tprk for the correction of myopia of 0.75 to 4.75 diopter sphere with astigmatism of 2 diopters and the consideration was given that the difference of ablation of depth was less than 10 microns in exclusion uh, ocular or systemic diseases that could affect epithelial healing were excluded surgical technique it's two step uh, two step t prk epithelial removal with phototherapeutic keratectomy ptk by 50 microns was done later exam exam laser corrected the power mitomycin c was uh, uh, given uh, to the uh, superficial layer uh it was uh, in the range of one di- for one diopter for 10 seconds post operative treatment regimen uh, re- remained the same for all patients and bcl was applied to find the efficacy of post operative follow up uh, the follow ups were planned for first second and fourth day on follow up the visual acuity area of epithelial defect size was calculated uh, by the measurement with the slit lamp with the formula which is cited on the slide a and b are the shortest and the longest area of defect uh, respectively area was measured with the sle- uh, by slit lamp having an uh, eyepiece with graticules subjective scoring of pain photophobia foreign body sensation watering was on to the likert scale of 0 to 3 grade on fourth day corneal healing pattern was uh, graded evaluated compared to irregular regular or no sutures these are the pictures of the patients uh, on the fourth day with the rate of reepithelialization showing no sutures regular sutures and irregular sutures on the cornea results the mean age was 23.2 with deviation of 3.26 years enroll patient out of enroll patients 19 were male and 11 were female in both groups uh, the mean spherical equivalent and ablation depth was uh, approximately kept same where the p value was non significant mean visual acuity on day 1 day 2 and day 4 was non significant in both, both both the groups pain score in both the groups on day 1 was higher but day 2 and day 4 was reduced and p values were non significant area of epithelial defect size in two groups uh, on day 1 was little higher but on day 2 and day 4 it was uh, negligible with p value non significant 
suture pattern in Comophilcon A, uh, even though the number of patients in no sutures and regular sutures were high, the Fabricon uh, low patients, the p values were non significant. You have one minute to wrap up. Photophobia, foreign body sensation, and watering were uh, non significant uh, on the evaluation. Discussion BCL used for three to five days for the extended period of TPRK. As per suggestions of Holden and Mertz, the minimum DK required was 87. Our lenses had the DK by T more than 87. The previous studies had compared between first, second, and third generation silicon hydrogels, whereas we compared in third generations itself. Conclusion, DK by T difference of third generation silicon hydrogen lenses are not a barrier for selecting as BCL. The both third generation silicon hydrogen that is Comfilcon A and Fanfilcon A lenses can be used effectively as BCL for after TPRK. Acknowledgement to Medical Research Foundation and team for the platform. Nagri Municipal Eye Hospital and Nagar School of Optometry for support in the study. Dr. Shwetambari as a LASIC consultant and patients for their trust and consent. Thank you. Thank you, Usman. I request you to stay back. Uh, we'll take up the questions at the end of all the sessions. So we'll move on to the next presentation. That is by uh, Mr. Asif Iqbal from Shankar Nefraniya. He is going to present on influence of mini spheral contact lenses on corneal curvature and parkimetry in keratoconic eyes. Good evening, everyone. I am Asif Iqbal. I will be presenting my research topic entitled Influence of Miniscular Contact Lens on Corneal Curvature and Tachymetry in Keratoconic Eyes, which is done under the guidance of Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan. These are the abbreviations I am going to use. Uh, introducing miniscleral lenses, a smaller version of scleral lenses, which completely cover the cornea and rest on the uh, bulbar conjunctive and sclera. It creates a liquid bandage over the ocular surface, which is useful for fragile and diseased cornea and for dry eyes. So relative rigidity of these lenses also helps in superior optical performances. So with the above characteristics, miniscular lenses has become a boon for patients with irregular corneas like keratoconus and different corneal surface disorders. So there are several studies they have uh, reported that corneal curvature and tachymetry changes due to the negative pressure of post-lens TLR and hypoxia related complications, corneal swellings and can give a wrong impression of keratoconus progression. So there are very limited studies those assess the influence of miniscular lenses on corneal curvature and pachymetry in keratoconic eyes. Hence the aim of the study was to investigate the influence of miniscular lenses on corneal curvature and pachymetry in keratoconic eyes and to evaluate the same parameters with Pentacam at baseline after six hours and after one night of lens removal. Uh, all subjects with keratoconus confirmed with pentagam reports, subjects with endothelial cell count of about 2000 cells per millimeter square, eligible for miniscular lenses, lens fitting were included, and any patient less than 18 years were excluded, any ocular surface disorder, any eye injury and associated ocular pathology apart from keratoconus and ocular surgery was excluded from this study. So the present study lens was a non stated 6 mm diameter manual inlet miniscular contact lens, which was made from a high DK material and the lenses were fitted according to manufacturer's guideline. The initial world was assessed with the slit lamp by microscope with the help of very state university getting scales. Corneal thickness and cur corneal curvature without lens on eye was measured with pentacam HR. The mean value of three repeated measurements were used for analysis. So the measurements were started after two hours of happening to minimize the influence of overnight swelling. Baseline corneal curvature and thickness was measured in the morning between 8 am to 9 am, 8, 9 am before lens insertion. And um, then corneal curvature and thickness was remeasured immediately after lens removal with Pentacam after six hours of lens wire. And then after one night of washout period, the same measurements were 
we are done again on the next morning between 8 am to 9 am so statistical analysis were performed using SPSS software parametric tests such as duplicate measure analysis of variance and Pearson's correlation test was used for inferential analysis. A P, P value of less than 0 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Coming to the results now, insert the demographic details. The lens thickness was 230 with standard deviation of 22 micron at the lens center and the mean final central corneal clearance was 670 uh, with a standard deviation of 110 microns. So while, while comparing different parameters like K, flat K, steep K, K max and central corneal thickness at pupil, present study reported no statistically significant difference between the measurements timing at baseline immediately after lens, lens removal and after one night of lens removal. While correlating different parameters, present study reported no statistically significant uh, significance, significant correlation between the parameters. So coming to discussion now, corneal curvature parameters could be influenced by the eyelid pressure, the negative pressure created by the liquid layer between lens and cornea and corneal swelling. So uh, present study reported flattening in average K flat of 0.28 diopter, steep K 0.37 diopter and in K main 0.20 diopter and which regressed back to baseline, which was consistent with the previous studies done by Nian K et al and Bilson et al. Present study reported a corneal uh, edema of 1.0776 with a standard deviation 1.54 percentage which regress back to normal and it was within the normal limit of uh, normal closed eye physiological corneal edema which was consistent with the previous studies. Uh, corneal curvature change of 0 0.20 to 0 0.37 diopter after 6 hours could be clinically significant for extended virus those who are using for 12 to 14 hours. These temporary changes can give a negative impression on disease progression and decision making on collagen cross linking. The practitioner should be very careful while measuring corneal parameters in ministerial contact lens user as the alteration of corneal curvature after lens removal may mask the disease progression or corneal stiffening. So our study was limited by sample size as the sample size was small and no control group was available. Measurements more than three point time points may have provided more information like after every hour, one hour of lens removal, which was difficult in clinical daily practice. Uh, in conclusion, miniscular contact lens were may cause marginal flattening in the anterior corneal curvature parameters and increased corneal thickness. This changes uh, regress back to baseline after overnight lens discontinuation. Topographic measurements should be performed after discontinuation of the lens for at least one overnight, then immediately after lens removal. This will help in exact decision making on keratoconus progression in immunoscular virus. We recommend further studies to observe the long-term consequences of miniscular lens one after 12 to 14 hours per day or after months and years. The recovery should be measured at every hour after lens removal, which would provide more clinically relevant information. None of the authors had any uh, personal or financial conflict of interest. I acknowledge all, all participants of the study and entire contact lens department. Thank you. Thank you, Asif, for even keeping up the time. So we'll move on to the next presentation, which is by Ms. Pooja Nandagopal uh, from Manipal College of Health Profession. She's going to talk on soft multipurpose contact lens solution, not to be too soft against fungal. Over to you, Pooja. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everyone. Myself, Pooja Nandagopal here to talk on the topic soft contact lens multipurpose solutions not to be too soft against fungi. So, contact lens market is seeing a stable growth uh, of about one. Okay. Yeah, you can continue. You can continue. Okay. So, contact lens market is seeing a stable growth of about 140 million people worldwide. Though contact lenses are commonly used for refractive error correction, cosmetic reasons, and therapeutic purposes, uh, they also result in complications leading to severe, mild to severe ocular morbidity, of which the most severe complication remains a microbial keratitis.
हेलो मैम देर इज नेटवर्क सॉरी फॉर द टेक्निकल इश्यूज मैम इट्स फाइन पूजा यू कैन गो हेड Contact lens market is seeing a stable growth of about 140 million people worldwide, of which uh, so the though contact lenses are commonly used for refractive error corrections, cosmetic reasons, therapeutic purposes, they also result in mild to severe ocular morbidity, of which the most severe complication remains a microbial keratitis. And it is reported that contact lens users are 80 times more risk of developing microbial keratitis than non-contact lens users. Looking at the causative agents, they vary based on geographic locations and climatic conditions, of which fungi being most commonly reported in India and Nepal. Contact lens associated fungal keratitis increased from five. Percent to fifty-five percent in two thousand, and but it was not directly linked to contact lens wear until there was a multi-country outbreak of Fusarium keratitis in the middle of two thousand five to two thousand six. So this multi-country outbreak of Fusarium keratitis was due to the uh, contamination of specific brand of contact lens solutions along with the non-compliance of the patient. So uh, looking into the causes, the first and the foremost cause is the non-compliance of the patient, leading to the contamination of contact lenses and contact lens care products. So this contamination can be about 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 colony forming units, and here marks the need for a disinfecting solutions. So 90% of the contact lens users uh, are currently using multi-purpose contact lens solution as a major source of disinfectant, and it is also important to remember that 83.6% of the contact lens users are purchasing. using contact lenses and solutions over the counter so it is important that all the solution which are marketed and sold should be effective against the broad range of organism so success of any contact lens wear depends on the care and regimen with this the main aim of the study was to evaluate the antifungal efficacy of eight soft contact lens multipurpose solutions against the three most common organisms so these are the included organisms and these are the eight included solutions so it is important to note that four of the solutions had a minimum disinfecting time of 6 hours and four of the solution had a minimum disinfecting time of 4 hours so for the experiment as a control talbeco phosphate buffered saline with twin was used so uh, once the solution has been obtained from the market the solutions were coded from a to h in order to avoid the personal bias during the experiment and before the experiment the solution were uh, screened for contamination and during contamination solution h was found to be contaminated with gram negative bacteria and hence it was eliminated from further testing so after the ethical clearance the solutions were obtained and the fungal culturing was done based on the iso requirements so after the fungal culturing stand alone test was carried out and stand alone test was carried out at different time intervals because there were set of solution which required 6 hours of disinfectant time and there was a set of solution which requires 4 hours of disinfectant time followed by the stand alone test colony forming units and log reductions were calculated so it is important to note that a minimum of one log reduction was required for the solution to pass against the fungi So this is the result. So this table depicts the log reduction value of all the tested organism at different time intervals. So it is seen that the log reduction value improved with prolonged soaking time. And except solution F, all the solutions were able to obtain a minimum of one log reduction by hundred percent disinfectant time. And this is against the aspergillus flavors. Except solution B. only the solution d was able to pass the primary criteria by 100% of the disinfectant time and against aspergillus against fusarium solanae except solution b and solution f all the solution were able to acquire a minimum of one log reduction by 100% disinfectant time so this graph represents a log reduction value at uh, of all the solutions at different time intervals and it from this we can see that the solution had a better efficacy against candida albicans comparatively good efficacy against fusarium solanae and had a poor efficacy against aspergillus flavors so this is a summary table depicting that uh, which all solution passed the primary criteria and which all solution failed the primary criteria so from this study solution b with polyquaternium and aldox as an active biocide uh, was effective against all the three organism tested so poly it is because the polyquaternium one uh, which had a 
better antibacterial activity combined with aldox which has a broader spectrum of antifungal activity the efficacy rate was improved and with mps e and g which is which has dual and triple disinfectant was effective against candida albicans and fusarium solanae but was not effective against aspergillus flavors though solution a b c and f had polyexidine has an active biocide solution f did not pass the primary criteria against a challenge organism so this marks and tells that even the solution with the same disinfectant efficacy uh, disinfectant the efficacy rate varies based on the formulations so it is also important to note that uh, Uh, out of seven MPS, only one solution passed the primary criteria against aspergillus flavors. But the solu as uh, the efficacy against aspergillus flavors is not well studied. It is important to study because all the indoor spores which are present within the uh, are which are present within the indoors. in india is the aspergillus species so uh, concluding mpsd showed a better antifungal efficacy rate and efficacy rate improved with prolonged soaking so it is always recommended to recommend a solution which passes the iss criteria to the patients so along with prescribing a, dis a stronger disinfectant it is also important to recommend uh, the patient and emphasize on the cleaning regimen in order to maintain the uh, safety of the contact lens wear thank you Thank you, Pooja. So we will now wait for the questions at the end, and I also request the participants uh, who are viewing through the YouTube channel to post your questions there. That will also be taken at the end of the oral presentation. Uh, and I request the speakers to go a bit slow, because uh, you should understand that this is a uh, uh, streaming. So when you are very fast, people will not be able to hear it well. So let's move to the fourth presentation by Mr. Mahesh Kumar from Shankar Netralia, who is going to present on the pattern of contact lens wear in pediatric minors. Uh, very good evening to all present here. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation on research. Uh, on pattern of contact lens in pediatric myopes so these are the abbreviations used in this presentation myopia is one of the major causes of vision impairment of 2.5 billion myopes in the world over 140 billion are using contact lenses which is about 5 to 6% of the total myopes by 2050 there would be 5 billion myopes in the world of which 1 billion will be of high myopes there has been an increased interest in fitting contact lenses for children due to advancement in materials modalities and myopia control strategies the usage of contact lenses in children and adult has increased their visual satisfaction along with self perception it also made them play sports comfortably in a study by burton et al showed that majority of the referral for contact lenses was for myopia followed by fak and keratoconus and most commonly prescribed contact lenses was rgp followed by daily wear soft lenses In a study by Jeffrey et al showed that myopic children could wear their lenses independently that they didn't have any difficulties in terms of vision comfort application of lenses and removal of lenses in another study by Wang et al showed that RGP is a safe and effective treatment in myopic children with amblyopia which has shown the resolution of 67% in all the studies they looked at the common ocular disorders along with the refractive errors and uh, the <coughs> type of lenses given for them in our study we exclusively looked at the overall profile of myopic children fitted with contact lenses this guides us to know the availability of lenses in this specific group of people the specific uh, objectives in the study were to list down the type and modality of lenses dispensed for them and to find out the visual and refractive status of children fitted with contact lenses study was approved by institutional review board of medical research foundation sankar netralia it was a retrospective study in which we retrieved the data from january 2016 to december 2018 the inclusion criteria says that age less than or equal to 15 years old myopic children who underwent contact lens trial exclusion criteria myopic children who underwent ortho care treatment affected on myopia due to surgical intervention or any incomplete data so we basically collected the data from electronic medical record Uh, of the 127 myopic children, 119 were eligible for the study, and the uh, details regarding the demographic information and details details about the glasses and lenses were documented along with the lens parameter details for their baseline visit. Statistical analysis was performed using Excel spreadsheet and SPSS 
Wilcox and Scientan test was performed for visual acuity and refractive error uh, to know the difference and the significance between the glasses and contact lenses. So, of the 119 children who were fitted, uh, who underwent contact lens trial, 90 were given the lenses, 29 didn't go for contact lenses. And of the 29, of the 90 children, which included 123 eyes, majority of them are having severe myopia. So, in the eyes, number of eyes dispensed, higher proportion of them were having off-the-shelf lenses compared to the custom-made lenses. So, the most commonly prescribed contact lens was soft and soft auric compared to RGP lenses. So, among the soft and soft auric, when we categorized it based on the replacement modality, we could see that biweeklies and monthlies were the most commonly prescribed contact lens were uh, compared to the quarterly disposable custom-made lenses. The visual acuity, uh, the refractive error of the average with glasses was about minus 10 diopter, 10.83 diopter and in contact, contact lens it was about minus 9.22 diopter. In all the degrees of myopia, we could see that majority of them are given soft and soft auric available stock lenses as compared to quarterly disposable and RGP custom made lenses. So visual equity had significantly improved in all the degrees of myopia for distance, whereas there was slightly less uh, vision noted with contact lenses when shifted from glasses in severe myopic cases for Neo. And coming to the discussion, uh, the lens type was selected based on age, refractive error, available lens parameters and replacement modality. 29 of the children didn't go for contact lenses due to various reasons like fear of lens wear, affordability or difficulty to maintain and come for follow-ups. Majority of them, which is about 90% of the eyes, were given soft and soft auric lenses in our study, which was in contrast to a study by Burton et al, wherein he had showed that 54% of them were given RGP lenses. There were two reasons. One, he looked at the common ocular disorders along with the refractive errors, uh, such as keratoconus and aphakia. And the other thing is that uh, they didn't have uh, enough or the, there were only limited lens availability at that point of the time in, in that study. Biweeklies and monthlies were the most preferred option in our study which was due to the fact that there was greatest advancement in materials and modalities and extensive range of lens parameters available, which helps the practitioners as well as the patients in saving their time while maintaining the better corneal health and giving them the best lens possible. And the best character visual equity when shifted from glasses to contact lens has significantly improved in our study, which was similarly seen in an other, another study by Wang et al. Uh, but then the vision was not up, up to the mark, which was suboptimal in our study, could be due to the fact that majority of them, which is about 70% of the children, had to undergo treatment for anisometropic amblyopia uh, in the form of vision therapy or patching. And the severe myopic uh, patients had very slightly lesser near vision with contact lenses, could be due to the accommodative demand increased when shifted from glasses to contact lenses. So uh, the, their follow-up needs to be noted to understand whether they had increased in their near vision or not. The limitation in our study is that we could have seen the difference between the new wearers and experienced wearer to exactly know the selection of lenses in myopic children. As I concluded by saying that majority of the pediatric myops could be fitted with off-the-shelf soft and top, soft auric lenses, the preference for soft monthly and bi-weekly for myopic children has become higher due to extensive range of lens availability and higher modality uh, lens wear. Visual equity had significantly improved in all the degrees of myopia in our study. The recommendation is that we didn't even see a single case or single child given daily disposable lenses in our study, uh, which is uh, safe and gives better compliance for the children, which doesn't require much of attention on the care and maintenance, which needs to be studied further as to why children are not given daily disposable lenses uh, in myopic children. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Now, let's move on to the last talk of the day. The scientific session is by Ms. Aparna Badranarayanan, who is going to talk on the pattern of closed device practice in patients with ocular surface disorders, a five year analysis study. Good evening, everyone. 
I'll be presenting my clinical research study, Pattern of Prose Device Practice in Patients with Ocular Surface Disorders, a five year analysis study. Ocular dis surface disorder is characterized by reduced quantity of tears, poor tear quality, which leads to an unstable tear film. Patients may experience irritation, burning sensation, fluctuating vision, photosensitivity, etc., depending on the degree of the severity. Ocular surface rehabilitation is quite a challenge in patients with severe ocular surface disorder because of the other associated anomalies. A particular rehabilitation technique which has gained a lot of momentum in the past few decades is a scleral contact lens. A scleral contact lens, as you know, has a liquid reservoir in between the cornea and the contact lens, which aids in vision and comfort enhancement in patients with OSD. Uh, with the advent of new materials with high decay by D, patients are able to wear these lenses for longer uh, wear hours comfortably. And uh, customized larger diameter uh, lens can be made, which protects the entire ocular surface. Optics of the lens, along with the stable tear reservoir in between, increases the vision significantly. The aim of our study is to evaluate the clinical outcomes of Pro's device on visual and functional aspects of uh, patients with ocular surface disorders in a tertiary eye care center. We chose Pro's device because it is FDA approved and it can be, uh, it has a wide range of customization available. With the results of this study, practitioners can uh, reduce the charting of the patients by practicing uh, the prescribing pattern uh, which will be resulted and uh, also improve the success rate of the, uh, len uh, success rate of the uh, lenses by adapting a few practice uh, in their uh, clinics. So ours is a large retrospective study, uh, data of patients who were dispensed with the uh, pros device for a five year period were collected, which included 192 eyes with, uh, of 147 patients. The most common ocular surface disorder, which we came across in our study have been listed here. The data collected were uh, the demographic details of the patients, ocular surface disorder they were suffering from, surgical status of the eye, presence of corneal scar, final dispense device parameters, symptoms and signs of the patient during the follow-up visits, success rate of the lens wear, recent for dropout, modifications done or after the initial dispensing, total number of devices dispensed including the renewed and the modified devices, average wearing time and average years of follow-up. All these uh, data were collected and analyzed to arrive at the following results. The surgical status of the eye, improvement of vision with the device, uh, uh, the device parameters to understand the prescribing pattern of the device, continuity of lens wear and the follow-up data. So uh, the basic statistical analysis with Excel spreadsheet was done for our study. So uh, surgical status is quite important during the trial lens selection, the diameter selection for the trial lens. The most common surgi surgeries which were performed in patients with OSD were mucous membrane graft, amniotic membrane graft, punctal cautery, and other minor surgeries. So best corrected visual equity with spectacles was 0.73 logmar units, which improved to 0.28 logmar units with Pro's device. So the prescribing pattern of parameters like the vault, haptic curvature and diameter have been given here. This is for pros device in ocular surface disorder patients. Almost half the re uh, devices required haptic toricity in one or more than one meridians. So the number of lens modifications required uh, following the initial dispensed lens was uh, from one to a maximum of five lenses because of uh, symptoms, patient symptoms like irritation, pain and discomfort and also clinical signs like edge lift, ha tight haptics or turbidity. Uh, seven and a half hours patients were able to use the lens approximately for seven and a half hours comfortably and average number of years of follow up after lens dispensing was around three years. Almost 60% of the devices were being successful, used successfully and the major reasons for dropout from lens wear was uh, the inability to follow up with the clinic, uh, no significant improvement in vision, inability to handle the lens properly, affordability among others. Coming to the discussion part, our study is unique since we have analyzed the pattern of pros practice exclusively in eyes with ocular surface disorder over a large period of time. Previous studies which have been done on similar lines have reported on various ocular conditions and that also with limited data. And being in a tertiary eye care center, we were able to work with a wide range of ocular surface disorder. 
uh, as reported in previous studies in our study also there was a significant improvement in vision 0.45 uh, logmar units improvement in vision with closed device so the lens parameters median vault was 4.85 smaller diameter lenses were given for patients pediatric patients patients with uh, handling difficulty or smaller palpebral aperture and a larger diameter lenses were prescribed for patients who required protection for the entire ocular surface because of the structural changes of the conjunctiva and the scleral torosity almost half the uh, devices were prescribed with haptic torosity in one or more than one meridian the same reason why number of modifications were quite high in patients with uh, osd compared to other ocular conditions 80% of the devices were prescribed without any front surface eccentricity which correlated with the presence of a corneal scar so the main reason for success in uh, uh, so success of closed device in patients with osd was the enhancement in comfort and improvement in vision this drastically improves the quality of life in these patients the rate of dropout can be further reduced by uh, uh, giving enough chair time for the patient to practice the lenses uh, teaching the attender if the patient is not able to handle the lens and also giving devices such as a stand to uh, improve the practice uh we should emphasize on the follow up and care regimen to the patient so the major leverage of our study is that we have analyzed the pre during and the post prospecting aspects both visual and functional aspects in our study uh, the improvement of uh, the status of the ocular surface was not reported in our study which is a limitation so with proper follow up a significant number of devices will be used efficiently Uh, a few instructions from the practitioner side and a few adaptations from the patient side will improve the success rate and we as practitioners can give the patients with ocular surface disorder a better tomorrow with these lenses thank you so much thank you aparna so with that uh, we come to the end of the oral presentations so now i request uh, Dr. Anita and Dr. Aishwarya to start with the questioning. Uh, so, we'll first, uh, put forward the questions to Mr. Usman. Uh, Aishwarya, would you like to start the questioning? Yeah, as usual, the mic was on mute. Hi, Usman. Hi. Good evening. So. Uh, i had uh, quite a number of questions it's a very good study to look at the efficacy of a specific type of bandage contact lens so uh, when we talk about efficacy what we are looking at here is the uh, intended result or the desired result so uh, what was your desired outcome with the bandage contact lens and how was it actually quantified that was not very clear uh, what we did was uh, Uh, the previous uh, studies we took for the review mm -hmm. had all the studies which were comparing either hydrogels with silicon hydrogel or first second and third generation uh, on hydrogel okay uh, we have been giving silicon hydrogel uh, initially in 2017 uh, avira which is again a, a third generation uh, silicon hydrogel which was introduced by cupervision okay Uh, we wanted to understand how is the uh, both lenses going to work uh, on as a bandage contact lenses uh, because both lenses have change of 50 dk by t okay so uh, we thought of quantifying this uh, parameters uh, looking at uh, uh, symptomatic review look uh, taking into consideration as pain which is uh, a tprk uh, uh watering photophobia and the corneal healing and okay. lenses proved to be good uh, uh symptomatically as well as uh, on the corneal corneal healing basis okay and uh, there were no other uh confounding factors like both both the group of patients were on same uh, amount of lubricants following the surgery medications following the surgery and All their tachymetric values were comparable pre surgery since i saw the refractive errors were comparable were the tachymetric values also comparable yeah, they were comparable they were comparable and we have also taken into consideration those patients whose ablation uh, uh, post surgical was less than 10 uh, microns okay 
I just have one question. You had mentioned about double blinding in that. Uh, so, so can you explain what was done? Because they, you have mentioned that uh, the lenses were was not aware uh, which eyes fitted with which uh, lens. Okay. Number one. Number two. Uh, ophthalmologist who was inserting a lens post surgery was handed the lenses by one of the assistant who was uh, maintaining a rec record that which eye has been given with which lens and which was not disclosed to us uh, till the results were uh, clear. So, uh, assistant was there which eye was given which lens uh, in this manner. They are all in the blindfold which lens is given eye and we were just estimating what are the results. And at the end we uh, came up with uh, we disclosed what was from the assistant once the result were clear. So you also had mentioned that you had uh, looked at the pain score, right? Yeah. At the end of uh, day two and four. So uh, few of this one of the slide uh, there was no mention about uh, the pain score levels in day four. Well, and because pain score was uh, the patient did not uh, give any uh, symptomatic value for the pain. So, uh, uh, it was okay. Okay. Um, um, Anita, you can... Uh... Yeah. Uh, Usman, it's been established that uh, silicon hydrogen lenses are the lenses of choice uh, for post-PRK, right? Uh, what was new from your study? You have just compared uh, between two third generation third. silicon hydrogels. Uh, what was something new out of this uh, current study of yours? Uh, uh, why we uh, took into this study was uh, when we talk of biofinity as a lens, the positive is higher. Avira cost is number one factor. Uh, number two, from patient's perspective, number two, with the change of decay. So we wanted to understand yes, uh, silicon hydrogels are good. Generation one, generation two, generation three, both. But comparatively, which is that is what we were trying to look at the study. Okay. Uh, did you get to compare the discomfort score? Because uh, was there any correlation between eye discomfort, uh, the pain score, and the re-epithelialization of uh, the cornea? Sorry. Were you able to have any correlation between the re-epithelialization pain score and the eye discomfort on day one and day four? Uh, no, we did not have the correlation between uh, this uh, ingredient, uh, this parameters. Uh, we have just compared what was within uh, day one, day two for pain and discomfort. One last question. Uh, did you check for a long-term uh, effect of uh, these lenses on the follow-up visit like post three months or uh, six months? Because I understand the study was uh, run over a period of six months. There is a, quite a possibility that you, had, you would have evaluated these patients over a long period and not just uh, uh, correlate on the fourth day score alone. Uh, no, we uh, we have taken them as a bandage contact lens. So once the fourth day or fifth day healing is done, the bandage contact lenses are removed, and then we did not take the, those patients into the study again. Okay, so the follow up visit uh, post PRK was not done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. There were no questions for uh, Usma from the uh, participants too. So let's move to the next presentation. Uh, Mr. Asif, the yes. questions to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Asif, uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear. So your study was on um, the parameter change with the mini scleral lens design. But yes, uh, I did not find uh, the thickness of the mini scleral lenses because uh, with the uh, different uh, powers of uh, the lenses, the thickness change also could affect the curvature changes, right? So, um, was there any note of that in your study? Um, lens thickness, ma'am. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So let's take this. Uh, we have we have uh, measured that uh, um, it was almost two two thirty with the standard deviation of eleven. I think eleven micron. And um, ex except the lens thickness, uh, all the uh, uh, lens thickness and everything, it was actually um, everything was maintained in in the parameters in the. In, in our study actually so, and See, um, based, uh, because based, the yeah. different powers uh, you cannot yeah. maintain the thickness of the lenses uniform across all power ranges right so there yeah. will be some influence of the thickness of the lens over uh, uh, curvature and pachymetry values so what is the influence of the lens thickness uh, did were you able to um, yeah. identify yeah. that yeah. Yes, ma'am. We have we have done some correlation in that lens thickness and corneal curvature uh, changes and corneal pachymetry uh, changes also. So our study has shown there was no, no statistically um, significant correlation in in in, in those uh, parameters. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Asif. Hey, hi, ma'am. Uh, so uh, thickness was one of the questions that I had as well. But yes. uh, the other question I had was mm -hmm. the usual washout period uh, you, we take for mini yes. scleral lenses is yes. about 48 hours, right? Why, why was it 24 hours in your study? That's yes. one question. Yes. And was there any quantification of the clearance, the lens clearance? Uh, yes. Was it compared with the changes in the keratometric and pachymetric values? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and my first question, like um, till now, actually we have we have seen three or four studies, and uh, they have mentioned three, three or four, three different timing of washout period. So there, till now, there is no exact consensus on that, like exactly when they should uh, remove the lenses. Actually, and one more point was that, like this keratoconus patient may be moderate to severe cases. Like the quality of vision and everything will be very, very uh, bad with glasses and also. Um, most of the time they will be reluctant to like use only with uh, um, contact lenses and all so till now the study like me in case waiters at all in keratoconic eyes normally what they have mentioned almost it takes almost seven days time in case of scleral contact lens or to uh, to get back these parameters in the normal normal range so because and, and that seven days time to discontinue lenses for any topographic measurement it is actually not possible for the uh, contact lens or mostly in case of keratoconic eyes so uh, that was the reason like uh, what, what uh, we have decided we have decided to do on the next day morning after one night which is a feasible time and that is possible practically for the patient also to uh, discontinue lenses at least uh, almost over overnight not even 24 hours also okay. if, uh, i have one question asif uh, how did you maintain that uh, each of your patients only wore it for six hours only because uh, in case of irregular uh, corneas, yes. these lenses are the second eyes. So they wear them uh, all through their waking hours. So yeah. it's not possible that uh, they wear it for a restricted uh, hour, like say just six hours in a day is too less. Yeah. What do they do the rest of the time? Because their vision um, is going to be impaired minus these lenses. Uh, spectacles yeah. obviously are not going to be giving the kind mm. of vision that is expected. Mm. So uh, how did you ensure this? Yeah, so this this all the measurements we have done in our clinic when the, when the present was pre patient was present in clinic. So, uh, and uh, they all were almost neophyte contact lens wearers. And uh, we have done all the measurements in our clinical setup. And for that, we were able to maintain the timing also, like within six hours uh, um, timing. And, and by considering the diurnal variation also, in that case, by maintaining the timing on first day and next day. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, what were the exclusion criteria for your study? Exclusion criteria, any ocular surface uh, other than keratoconus, any other pathologies, any surgery, uh, less than 18 years, we have um, excluded them. And those who are not able to handle this uh, are not interested, uh, who are not able to fit uh, miniscular contact lenses. So, uh, what is so novel about your study? What do you want to, what do you want clinicians to take home? Yeah, um, the, uh, the important uh, thing here is like that I told that exact exact uh, 
timing like uh, what will be the mi minimum timing like they can discontinue their lenses and go for the topographic measurement for further evaluation in their progression or not that is one thing and from clin clinician point of view if we consider like exactly it is it is it's not like that they have to discontinue lenses at least for 48 hours or maybe seven seven days so at least one one overnight discontinuation discontinuation of the lenses they can advise to their patients so at least they can get some um, exact result in topographic measurement which will not uh, which will not show any any difference and they it will give them the exact measurement of uh, topographic uh, other than overestimation or, or or underestimation in the parameters thank you okay so there's still this question of uh, fitting parameters versus changes in the thickness and keratometry you have any answer for that ma 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 I didn't get it. Yeah. So, uh, was there any uh, association between the scleral lens mini scleral lens fitting parameters like the amount of edge clearance or the amount of uh, uh, yes ma'am uh, versus your changes in the keratometry and pachymetry yeah, fitting parameters, these lenses were the final fitted lenses. So we have, after checking all the three hours, six hours, we have ordered the final lenses. And final lenses, when the, we saw all the measurements, everything was like within the normal limit. The patient had no impingement, nothing in the um, peripheral edge area and the central corneal thickness. Also, whatever we got, it was within the normal and uh, adequate, acceptable limit considering the corneal swelling. And we found no other correlation with, of these parameters which were affecting our measurements like corneal curvature and um, uh, corneal edema or corneal thickness changes. Okay. Um, Asif, there are two questions in the, from the participants yes. also. So one was related to the, um, more or less both are similar. So did you have the patients in the clinic for six hours? You said yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, the other one is, was not the patient being handed over the lenses to take home? Yes, that after after confirmation of all this fitting parameters that we have, we are giving them uh, one one lens which is not going to cause any significant corneal uh, corneal edema thickness changes and all the other parameters. After con con confirmation of those, we have handed over the lenses to the patient. Um, and then, did you call the patient, the patient for a follow-up? Yeah, we can we call the patient exactly after one month of follow-up. We we follow that for all the patients. Hope that answers the question of uh, so Ganesh Babu and Sharanya. So let's move on to the third person, Ms. Pooja. Yes, ma'am. Um, Anita, you want to start the question? Yeah, uh, Pooja, first and foremost, I really like the methodology that was uh, employed in your study. Uh, very well done. Um, Thank you. One thing that I want to know is like previous studies have already established that uh, uh, the multipurpose solutions containing polyhexanide and which um, uh, which kind of um, follows the ISO standard of 14729, uh, they are meant uh, to have high efficacy rates as an antifungal agent. So what new outcome was present in your study? Yes, ma'am. So usually the solutions which generally comes to the market will uh, pass the ISO uh, recom uh, criteria, recommended criteria. But what it is seen exactly is that uh, the first thing is the standard, uh, the strains which an ISO uses as a challenge organism. And that doesn't include aspergillus. But aspergillus as has been reported to be the most common uh, fungal organisms which causes infection. So we just tried to see if how is it, how is the solution's efficacy against the aspergillus species. And one more thing is the first reason was the contamination of the contact lenses. So indoor spores, if we see that generally the indoor spores, uh, which are the organisms present indoors are usually aspergillus. So the higher, there are higher chance of contaminations of contact lenses if not taken care properly. Okay. So what is the prevalence of aspergillus contamination um, generally that you notice? 
So prevalence of aspergillus contamination as such has not been reported, ma'am. So generally, the contamination with the fungal or I mean contamination of a contact lens solution ranges between 10 to the power five colony forming units to 10 to the power six colony forming units. But specifically, which organism is contaminated is uh, not known. Okay. Aishwarya or uh, Rashima? Oh, yeah. Uh, see, Pooja, you were talking about uh, one log unit change has to be as a significant factor. Yes. Right? So yes, how do you come up to a uh, one log, in, log unit change? Yes, ma'am. So, how did you so we that? then uh, calculate the log reduction at different time intervals. So we took the log reduction value at the base. Right. I mean, the baseline log reduction value. I mean, baseline colony forming units. So how many colony forming units were there uh, at the baseline? And how many colony forming units were there at the end of the manufacturer's recommended disinfectant time? So uh, the log reduction... Uh, the colony log of the colony forming units from the baseline minus the log of the colony forming units at the manufacturer's disinfectant time was taken as a final log reduction calculation. Uh, you had mentioned about 25%, 50%, 75%, right? Yes, so that is, uh, that is also measured because it varies with each uh, product. So you yes, ma'am. Uh, so few uh, four solution which I included had six hours of disinfectant. So twenty five percent of the six hours, fifty percent of the six hours, seventy five percent of six hours, hundred percent of the six hours, and the same way we did it separately for four hours disinfecting solution also. So twenty five percent of the four hours. So at the different time intervals, we calculated what is the colony forming units which was uh, grown in the petri plates. Okay. Uh, there was also a question in the uh, chat box. Uh, is there any relationship between the manufacturing date to the time of the study, which is like, does the efficacy of the solution decrease from the manufacturing time? Uh, the solutions which we uh, took was well within the expiry dates. So we bought the solutions and the solutions well within the expiry days. But there are studies reporting that the efficacy rates decreases uh, after uh, certain days of uh, usage. For example, the contamination of the solution starts by five days of usage. And one more thing is a storage solution. So wherever we store. So based on that also the... Um, uh, efficacy rate decreases. So for the experiment purpose, we just bought a new solution and under a well-controlled laboratory condition, we uh, uh, did the experiment so that to avoid all the other environmental confounding factors. But yes, efficacy rate is found to be uh, decreased after a few days of usage based on the storage temperature as well as the contamination. You mentioned that you were the blinded from what solution it is right yes yes ma'am okay um so it was only a b c d to touch whatever it is yes ma'am uh, but who helped you in uh, doing all these experiments is what only you or uh, with, uh, with no. the microbiologist who also helped you? yes ma'am uh, myself and the microbiologist was involved in this efficacy testing procedures. So blinding was done by uh, one more uh, laboratory person who was there. So they uh, blinded and they gave us the products and then we did the experiment. This is actually an interesting topic and much different from what we were uh, hearing yes. so far. Yeah, Aishwarya. Yeah, very much agree to that. The novelty is uh, definitely there. Um, I am curious about what will happen if the type of lens is different. Uh, if if it's a silicon hydrogel as opposed to a, um, a Senna Filcon or a Bala Filcon, will, will it change the efficacy of uh, the antimicrobial efficacy of the lens? Will it change? Sorry, uh, the lens solution. Yes, ma'am. So there are also studies telling that depending upon the matrix size and also the biocide size. Uh, so these biocides usually the uh, uh, goes and uh, gets attached to the matrix. So during those time, what happens is the efficacy rates are found to reduce, and it also induces uh, it also results in something called as a corneal straining, solution induced corneal straining. 
so uh, again the efficacy rate depends on the material as well so if the uh, if the biocides are getting attached to the matrix then it, they say that yes the solution efficacies are found to reduce okay so uh, yours was in an experimental setup and your recommendations are based on that uh, given that yes. our uh, contact lens cases are not going to be experimentally controlled uh, do you do you have some can you come up with some sort of equation that says this many this is if this is the age of the solution do your disinfection for this much time if the type of lens is this is there can you come up with something like this Well, uh, so from this, I can recommend telling that uh, all the contact lens users should uh, at least soak the solution for whatever the time the uh, uh, it is uh, whatever time the manufacturer has recommended. Because even from my study, it is seen that the efficacy rate improved with prolonged soaking time. So one thing is uh, the soaking time has to be maintained, and the other thing is the. Uh, frequent replacement of the contact lens cases as well as the contact lens solutions and the storage temperature as well as the storage space because if you keep in the moist uh, area it is said that by the five days of opening the contact lens tip uh, solution tips are uh, getting contaminated so it is always recommended to maintain a proper replacement schedule and the soaking time uh, as per the manufacturer recommendation Okay, and was there any relationship between the fungal load and the disinfection? Yes, ma'am. So this year, fungal load which we took is based on the ISO requirements. But higher the fungal load, the uh, uh, papers have. Been, I mean, higher the microbial load, the papers are again uh, reporting that uh, there is a reduced efficacy rate. But this is the standard one which has been given by ISO, so we used the standard requirements. Thank you, thank you, Pooja. Yes, ma'am. So on the same ground, uh, Sharanya has asked. Um, she has asked you about the manufacturing time, right? Yes, ma'am. She is inquiring whether all the products, all the solutions, had the similar, or at least more or less, the similar dates of manufacturing or not. Did you look into that? No, I didn't look into that, ma'am. I just uh, checked whether it is within the expiry date or not. Okay. okay, maybe that is a good point for you. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, Anita, uh, I'm done. Okay, so we'll move on to the next then. Uh, the question to Mahesh. Okay, I'll start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Mahesh. Uh, have a couple of questions here. Uh, did you look at the reason for referral to contact lenses? Why the uh, candidates first came to contact lens clinic for a contact lens? fitting uh, so by seeing the results what we had uh, what we had uh, is that uh, many of them were having amblyopia can't so hear you well mahesh sorry can you hear me ma'am now yeah, yes now it's fine okay so uh, of the children we have seen many of them were having anisometropic amblyopia so for the treatment of vision therapy and patching they were referred here so that they could improve better with contact lenses uh, so that is the reason why uh, there were very less mild and moderate uh, myopic cases compared to severe myopia okay and um, was the fitting monocular or binocular in your cases uh, we have basically taken the number of eyes not the number of patients so some of uh, some few were having uh, both eyes few had only one eye okay and uh, do you have any follow up for this 90 90 patients who did go in for contact lenses yes yes all of uh, I, uh, so of the 119 children 90 were given the lenses and they are coming for follow ups uh, we we do have data for them uh, few have dropped out of the studies but the, that that has to be studied further as to why they dropped out of this uh, using contact lens okay okay fine Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mahesh, I have a question. You said uh, a number of uh, children in your study were anisometropes. Uh, so, did yes, you probe were they refractive or axial in origin? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, did you uh, arrive at uh, um, at a, a point where you uh, decided that contact lenses were the treatment of choice 
if it is an anisometropia basically uh, in the emr it has been recorded as anisometropia uh, few of them had a refractive anisometropia but uh, uh, it was not so except to mentioning the anisometropic amblyopia it was not so detailed about whether it was refractive or other sort of amblyopia so basically an unaware about the uh, cause of anisometropia whether it was yes, yes, or axial in origin so you yes, kind of presume that they were all refractive in origin and you went ahead with the contact lens dispense right yes ma'am okay rashimo yeah uh mahesh there were multiple questions for uh, your talk in the chat box also okay, so before i start with a question uh, can you tell me how many eyes were included from how uh, many pictures uh of the 168 eyes 123 123 were included into the eyes how many patients patients 127 children 127 children okay of so that, that 119 Yes, ma'am. Of that, there was some confusion children, in the numbers, I believe. So people have pointed out that. Um, okay. You had mentioned in one of the slide about uh, off-the-shelf versus custom-made, uh, yes, which was actually uh, preferred by the practitioners in general. uh so most of them prefer to go for off the shelf soft and softoric lenses because uh, uh in for the past 10 years or so there has been a uh, greatest uh, advancement uh, in the contact lens materials and modalities and the frequency of lens wear so uh that is the reason most of them were prefer to go for soft and softoric lenses which are good for the corneal health as well as uh, maintains the oxygen permeability uh, throughout longer wearing hours see uh, in your study in the discussion you have mentioned that 29 people they were it was not dispensed so did yes, you probe into the reasons for not the patient not getting into the lens uh actually uh, whatever is mentioned in the uh, plan of action were documented it was based on uh, they either they were not willing to go for contact lenses or they uh, they they were afraid of you know coming for follow ups and maintaining the lenses uh, would be difficult for them and parents basically uh, deny to go for contact lenses okay so it is uh, parents fear for lenses that was the reason yes. for yes uh, yes yes, no. yes. Um, there was also a question which is very similar to this uh, looking at the dropout rate So many people yes. have dropped out. So yeah, looking at the dropout rate. Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, we we have few data, but uh, we need to uh, again uh, go have a look into it. Uh, just curious, why you have dropped in your subjects? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, because uh, when we shift the patients, children from uh, glasses to contact lens. for especially in severe myopia because of the vertex differences the accommodative demand increases so this could be one of the reasons why they were having slightly less vision it was not it was not so uh, minimal but there was slightly reduced vision found when shifted from glasses to contact lenses could be due to the factor of accommodative demand for which maybe that we need to see the next follow up whether they had improved uh, in their near vision or not okay um can we go to the next step yes yeah aparna yes so questions for you uh, can i start sure yeah aparna um you have mentioned that we aim that it was to look at the functional aspects but yes. you had uh, we're discussing only about the vision and we were discussing about uh, the reasons for uh, dropout things so what were the other functional aspects you have looked at so the functional aspects during the follow up visits we have uh, analyzed the functional aspects like the way the patients are handling the lenses uh, whether the patient had some handling difficulty whether we can resolve all those difficulties those were the functional aspects we looked into and uh, yeah so they they are considered as functional aspects yes uh, and in one of the slide where you mentioned about uh, the median device which i don't understand what do you mean by median of one device can you explain that okay 
So uh, post uh, post uh, the dispensing of the first lens, ma'am, uh, patients with ocular surface disorders required modifications. So this modifications it actually range range from minimum of one device to a maximum of five devices per patient. So of the one ninety two eyes which we have considered, the the median modification number was one device, ma'am. So let's avoid it for that. Yeah. um how many patients were uh, changed because of ocular discomfort with the device okay so the number was really less uh, ocular discomfort uh, i have uh, so i have uh, as you know uh, i have mentioned it as no significant vision improvement or other handling difficulty if the patient had discomfort ma'am are you able to hear me yeah yeah continue there is some disturbance from somebody Can I unmute yourself and answer? Can you hear me now, ma'am? Yeah, I can hear now. So the ocular discomfort, the exact number we didn't take because it is purely subjective, ma'am. It differs from patient to patient depending on the ocular device. This is a large study. We plan to uh, publish it in a different uh, uh, paper. Actually, the ocular discomfort because the patient symptoms and the sign everything adds up to the ocular discomfort of the patient. So it is a vast topic. We plan to publish it in a different study. Actually. One of the slides I mentioned about uh, there is a possibility of the corneal opacity getting cleared up with the process yes. device. Did yeah. you see that in any of your patients? No, uh, actually, that is the uh, limitation of our study. I have mentioned that the ocular surface status improvement has not been analyzed. So, yeah, this could have been done, uh, but again, since it's a retrospective study, I'm not sure whether it could have been done to a complete. Uh, we could have done a complete justice to it. but certainly that could have been one aspect which should have been added to our study uh, anita uh, uh aparna i want to know uh, that the tertiary institute in which this retrospective study was conducted uh, do they even consider non pros devices for ocular surface disorders or yes. is it just uh, the pros devices No, 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 no. It is purely uh, depending on the trial. We select uh, different devices. The main reason which we have selected pros device patients for our study is uh, there were a lot of modifications done for uh, patients with ocular surface disorder. And since a pros device has a wide range of modification, and since it is FDA approved, we have selected this particular device for our study. But there were other devices which were dispensed to the patients also. so uh, i think uh, it would be nice if you could do a comparison study on uptake of um, you know uh, um, devices for ocular surface disorders pros versus the rest uh, because uh, when you consider devices it is uh, not uh, been uh, pop, i mean uh, dispensed at very many centers it is basically in very select um, uh, tertiary centers even in our country it is uh, very dismal the uh, number of uh, practitioners who are uh, proficient with pros devices right so uh, nevertheless uh, in continuation with what rashima had mentioned about ocular discomfort uh, was the osdi questionnaire run in all of these patients no no not really so yeah uh, again since it was a retrospective study we couldn't reach many of the patients over phone also so uh, we tried getting through for a few patients but uh, the response again since it was a long gap almost like we have uh, completed uh, uh, the dispensing uh, the study dispensing was completed by 2017 and uh, we have done the complete data collection during 2018 towards the end of 2018 on 2019 so we couldn't uh, do the osdi questionnaire okay but uh, running an osdi questionnaire <laughs> is not part of uh, the protocol for uh, ocular surface disorders it is not exactly a protocol but if if it had been done we could have uh, you know uh, 
justified the ocular surface discomfort in these patients surely exactly. so we need something to quantify the uh, ocular discomfort right yes, so sir. i mean osdi uh, i hello yeah i think your voice is breaking either there's a problem my end or your end i'm not too sure rashima can you take over yeah um ashura you can finish your question yeah uh, i also had uh, similar concerns like a qualitative uh, data about the patient's comfort is uh, very important when it comes to supporting the outcomes of uh, such devices and and also you know assessing the uh, functional vision using question as there are uh, there are tools that can evaluate functionality with such devices in everyday activity so uh, that was one of the questions and did you take into consideration the adaptation parameters were any painkillers given to the patient during their initial days or was it a part of uh, protocol of uh, the ocular surface disease treatment so Do we have uh, any such information overall we have uh, analyzed the medications which the patient were uh, taking during the trial period and during the follow up period so mostly almost 90% of the medications were only lubricant eye drops and uh, no other oral medications were given unless the patient had some other systemic condition so uh, as far as we have analyzed we haven't probed into it completely sure that is one aspect we could uh, look into further because one of the earliest studies i think way back in 2013 or it was an abstract i'm not sure they reported that providing painkillers during the initial phases had better acceptance in in the patients when they okay. did a, when they prescribed those devices for steven johnson syndrome especially steven johnson syndrome okay yeah that would be that would be it from me thank you okay um thank you all um, we are lagging by 10 minutes so uh, i thank uh, both dr anita and aishwarya for uh, their valuable suggestions to the presenters uh, over to you abhin yeah so that was a really educative and informative session i'm sure there would have been a lot of novel ideas which would be coming up in young clinicians mind so we will now have a discussion on specialty contact lenses in ocular surface disorders present and future from the experts in the field mr asif ikbal is a senior optometrist who is practicing specialty contact lens at shankar netralaya he is a student of dr rajeshwari mahadevan he will now take over the panel discussion thank you aparna good evening everyone thank you so much for joining us in this special evening of dr rajeshwari mahadevan memorial scientific session I welcome you all in today's panel discussion. My name is Asif Iqbal, and I'll be moderating the discussion, and also will be one of the panelists. So, without delaying further, let's let's start with the panel introduction. So, today we have esteemed optometrist, specialty contact lens practitioners with us to discuss on the amazing panel of specialty contact lens in ocular surface disorders and its present and future, where we will be discussing about and get expert opinion from. Uh, Uh, about the specialty lenses in uh, ocular surface disorders so first of all i would like to introduce dr anita arvin dr anita arvin graduated from prestigious led school of optometry and completed her phd from university of kwazulu natal south africa she is a consultant optometrist at a private clinic in bangalore specializing in fitting specialty contact lenses she is also a co educator for roske lenses in india she holds fellowship in iaql she is a reviewer for the journal of contact lens and anterior eye dr anita ma'am also will be joining me to moderate the session i welcome you ma'am to the panel thank you for joining us thank you similarly we have mr pritam kumar mr pritam kumar completed his bachelor in optometry from techno india college west bengal followed by a fellowship in clinical optometry before joining the cornea and contact lens services at lb prasad eye institute hyderabad He has published his research work in peer-reviewed journals. He is presently pursuing his PhD degree from City University, London, UK. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Pritam. I welcome you to the panel. Thanks, Ashish. Pass it. Yeah. Thank you. We have Miss Yunu Thomas. She completed her graduation in MPhil from Elite School of Optometry and presently pursuing her PhD in Manipal Institute of Higher Education in collaboration with University of New, New South Wales, Australia. 
currently working as uh, associate pro associate professor uh, uh, at department of optometry manipal college of health professions and she is also consultant optometrist at department of contact lens kasturba medical college manipal welcome to the panel and thank you for joining us ms reenu thank before you before we dive before we dive into the panel discussion let me give a brief introduction about different uh, ocular surface disorder here i will be presenting i will be showing you few images of ocular surface disorder we can um, see here the first image is a in, uh, eye of ocular superficial pemphigoid is a severe chronic autoimmune blistering condition which is also known as mucous membrane pemphigoid the next image is of uh, steven johnson syndrome and the next is a toxic epidermal like necrolysis is both a severe muc mucocutaneous reactions usually to the medications and causes severe ocular involvement the next image is the image of graft versus host disease that is an immune mediated inflammatory disorders the next image you can see a keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis sicca with filaments and severe dry eye secondary to jogren syndrome exposure keratopathy due to abnormal lens lids or lagophthalmos then limbal stem cell deficiency and pigment persistent epithelial defect due to the uh, rubbing of corneal surface and uh, keratinized lids lids so this patients will present with symptoms of severe dry eye foreign body sensation and redness and uh, many other uh, symptoms and with different clinical signs like conjunctival hyperemia erythema pseudo membranes cicatricial entropy and lag of thalamus corneal keratinization ulceration and new vascular lesion and it has been considered that specialty lenses are uniquely suited for this conditions and that is our esteemed panelists are going to share with us their knowledge and their experiences so delay without delaying further let me start with the panel so i would like to start with dr anita ma'am ma'am uh, if you if you can uh, give us some input like which specialty contact lens can be considered for uh, ocular surface disorders and if you can share your experiences of dealing uh, with these cases in your private practice thanks asif in fact uh, the oral presentation itself has apprised our audience with what uh, our uh, ocular surface disorders and uh, what are the treatment options nevertheless um, uh, what we understand is that ocular surface uh, disorders are multifactorial and they invariably present with ocular as well as uh, systemic variation so uh, having a thorough knowledge about the condition and the treatment options that are available for these disorders is very important and the uh, therapeutic uses of uh, contact lenses in uh, ocular surface disorders are well documented and there are very many published articles uh, to claim so so contact lenses are basically used in ocular surface di disorders in addition to other th therapies and uh, most frequently prior to any surgical intervention right so specialty lenses in uh, osds provide ocular protection and just shields to mechanical or exposure damage basically and uh, what they do is they in wound healing uh, pain relief and tissue protection so basically when you talk about what uh, lenses uh, constitute um, or are uh, considered for ocular surface disorders we have uh, lenses based on materials as well as types so presently we have soft lens they are the banded soft contact lenses and the gas permeable uh, material lenses so um, under the rigid gas permeable material lenses we have the corneal the cornea scleral as well as the scleral lenses for obvious reasons corneal lenses are not the lenses of choice uh, when you uh, talk about ocular surface disorders right because the lenses entirely bear over the cornea so we are left with corneal scleral lenses and the scleral lenses but it is very well established again that scleral lenses are the preferred lenses of choice when you talk about ocular surface disorders but uh, we cannot neglect the importance of corneal scleral um, Uh, lenses uh, in ocular surface disorders uh, why because uh, these lenses are uh, pretty much easier to handle and they work well especially in cases where the tear film is not compromised and where uh, the uh, surface of the cornea is not um, you know highly irregular 
right in ocular surface disorders we do find um, conditions which have high amount of irregularity but uh, when the surface ir irregularity is not too much and the tear film is not uh, you know moderately or severely compromised then we can consider uh, corneoscleral lenses as the therapeutic options for uh, a couple of ocular surface disorders. In fact, uh, there has been an Indian study which claims that uh, corneoscleral lenses uh, were, have been successfully used to improve the corneal surface uh, integrity and visual acuity in mucous membrane pemphigoid patients uh, with persistent epithelial defects. So I think uh, corneoscleral lenses do have a place um, as a therapeutic option for ocular surface um, disorders. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your inputs. Uh, I'll come to Mr. Pritham. Mr. Pritham, as a practitioner in a tertiary eye care center, tertiary eye care center, what is your take on this? If you can share your experience here with this type of cases. Hi. Uh, so Anita, ma'am, has already spoken about this corneoscleral lenses. I'll just touch upon uh, the scleral lenses and. Uh, Obviously, it needs no mention because we have seen with so many uh, nice studies that have been done uh, and, and the talk that is going on uh, that scleral lenses are here to stay and it is very quick, uh, quickly becoming a mainstay in uh, the surface abnormalities. Now, the advantage of these lenses are basically threefold. One, and partly that this has been touched upon by Anita Ma'am. So, uh, first thing is, first and foremost, it does not touch the corneal surface at any point of time or uh, it, it just lands on the anterior surface of the sclera. And so when I say it does not touch the corneal surface, neither at the center nor at the periphery, at the limbus. So uh, especially given the fact that it is a very, you know, when we are dealing with ocular surface abnormalities, we are dealing with a you know, vulnerable or a fragile uh, surface most of the time. So it is a very important factor. Added to that is the saline, the fluid reservoir that gets trapped under the lens and that especially helps to add as an extra cushion to improve the ocular surface. It, it, it sort of exaggerates or, you know, uh, aggra you know exaggerates in a good way uh, to improve the ocular surface. At the same time, the, the regular surface that it creates, the lens surface, the, the rigid gas permeable lens surface along with its saline under, trapped underneath, it creates an overall uh, regular surface that corrects the irregularity, that compensates for the irregularity that the surface uh, poses itself. So these are the basic, if I have to really summarize, these are the basic uh, three advantages that you know sets them apart uh, from the other different designs of contact lenses. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Wong. Uh, I'll come to Miss Renu. If if you can, uh, you can give some inputs on like, like how this lenses actually works, like uh, both uh, corneoscleral and scleral contact lenses. Okay, so um, the these lenses are a, like a full time moisture support. It's going to help your patient to first of all open the eyes and see. Because I have seen many patients with severe photophobia and eye pain, and uh, after lens insertion, like they are very comfortable. So from a patient point of view, they will require a very, very minimal use of lubricants and ointments uh, that will really, uh, that's like a burden for, uh, burden of treatment uh, is very less for this uh, patient. So this will help in cases where you need to actually apply a topical antibiotic to uh, depending on the pre-operative condition, uh, I mean post-operative condition. And for dehydrating amniotic membrane or a, uh, or a chronic condition with a bullous keratopathy or a corneal erosion, an extended wear contact lens is going to be an, I mean, these clearer lenses are going to be an excellent option. And uh, uh, so to summarize, uh, this will help in fast uh, wound healing, a moisturizer, a corneal protection from mechanical rubbing from the eyelid. So uh, as like it acts like a contact lens. And uh, I would put this as the last better visual equity. And it can uh, prolong uh, the surgical management and after all decrease the discomfort and symptoms of dry eye. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Ms. Renu. So I just want to add a few points, like you have already explained about corneal scleral, scleral contact lenses, how this lens actually helps. So just, I want to add a few things about um, soft contact lenses, soft bandage contact lenses, like, yeah, this, this lenses may stabilize the tear films and assist the restoration of epithelial cells turnover and potentially aid in the uh, management of um, corneal, corneal pain, like by shielding the nociceptor that uh, Anita Mam has already told to, uh, at the ocular surface. And again, uh, she mentioned the uh, material, yeah, development in material and availability in the uh, silicon hydrogel material also has uh, encouraged the application of these devices actually for uh, therapeutic purpose so uh, so this can be used as an extended wire basis also so if we if we divide in two part like small diameter or large diameters of contact lenses like small diameters can be used uh, mainly for recurrent corneal erosions or uh, abrasions whereas large dial lenses can be used for uh, um, uh, hindering the assembly for an, uh, formation or release the assembly for an, and protect uh, in cases of like if we consider boston keratoprosthesis and uh, uh, different, different other ocular surface conditions and uh, B cells can uh, also retain can as uh, act as a retention system that, that uh, Renu has already mentioned uh, for dehydrated amniotic uh, membranes in uh, ocular surface disorder. So along with corneal scleral lenses, scleral lenses, I think uh, if would this um, uh, good material like silicon hydrogel uh, bandage contact lenses, soft bandage contact lenses also can be very uh, helpful in this type of uh, ocular surface uh, disorder order cases and sometimes if you if you consider the affordability issues also in indian scenario so i think that also could be one uh, better option um, uh, while uh, comparing with the other uh, other model uh, other uh, lenses like on your students contact lenses so yeah. i think uh, that was a good uh, discussion uh, and uh, we get the uh, the voice is not breaking. Uh, is it from my end or it is? Uh, no, voice is breaking. All right, all right. Yeah. Whose voice is talking about is it mine? Yes, yes, yes Anita, ma'am. Yes, yours. Uh, is it clear now? Yeah, it's a little bit clear better. Now, yeah. Yes, yes. Basically, yeah. yeah, basically to sum up, we have scleral lenses, uh, which are uh, an invaluable therapeutic tool for patients with the uh, ocular surface disorders, as uh, these lenses provide uh, and protect the ocular surface, provide continuous uh, corneal hydrogen whilst providing optimal uh, visual correction and are often used in conjunction with other therapies. So, uh, aware of the different lens options that are available for um, ocular surface disorders. It is one of the challenges that we uh, face in fitting scleral lenses for ocular surface. Basically, when we talk of fitting uh, scleral lenses, we usually concentrate on the central fit, the uh, fit over the transition zone, the limbal um, clearance that you, is expected, and uh, the peripheral, the edge fitting scleral lens. So perhaps between the holes, we can kind of you know distribute different areas so we can not treat them and talk about the uh, challenges in uh, fitting the central zone of the lens and maybe I can uh, speak on uh, the limbal vault and the challenges that are uh, expected in that uh, zone of fitting and then Asif can follow it up with the uh, peripheral challenges in scleral lenses and uh, then uh, sum it up by uh, reading. So over to you, Pritam. Yeah, so as Anita ma'am was saying that if we really can compartmentalize the contact lens fitting and just like any other lenses, we would usually focus on central, paracentral or uh, at the limbal area and the ex extreme periphery. So I'm talking about the central part, that is a vault. Vault is nothing but, we most of us know about it. Uh, vault is nothing but the gap between the lens, the back surface of the lens and the corneal front surface. So the basic takeaway from, uh, and, or the basic things rather that we should remember that the gap should not be too much. So uh, the, the gap should not, first thing is gap should not be too less 
so that it touches at in, at no point the contact lens back surface should touch the anterior corneal surface because as i was saying in the previous uh, uh, topic as well previous question as well we were discussing about how uh, vulnerable or the fragile the epithelium corneal epithelium could be in when we are dealing with this ocular surface disorder condition and so a little bit of touch probably can you know ex exaggerate the condition or causes a significant mechanical damage to the cornea at the same time the the gap should not be too high as well because if the gap is too high there will be there could be an accumulation of uh, debris which which will get under which will get trapped under this lens and it will cause a reduction in vision so these are talking about vault it should neither neither be too much nor be too less so what is an ideal so how to, how to uh, you know come to so what is your take so my take on uh, what should be an ideal vault is and i usually go back to literature the literature suggests that usually 200 to 400 micron should be your ideal vault now when what 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 do i do for my patients that we treat with uh, ocular surface disorder that i want to typically keep them in the lower end of this uh, range for an example i would rather give a central vault of to, I'll, I'll try to keep it within 200 to 250 or maximum 300 micron not more than that so that will to some extent reduce the problem that we are facing with central vault so yeah up now uh, as if to talk about uh, no, the uh, perhaps, uh, I will be uh, talking about uh, the limbal zone because oh, uh, yeah. generally uh, when we talk about uh, scleral lens fitting, uh, most practitioners concentrate on the central vault and the uh, edge fitting to notice for compression or blanching of uh, the blood vessels. So kind, the limbal vault area is kind of neglected because the central vault and the peripheral uh, fitting take central stage rather. So, but serious complications can occur if the scleral lens bears on the limbal area. So there could be symptom, the symptoms of limbal bearing could be uh, redness irritation and reduced wearing time so you cannot neglect this zone the transitional or the mid peripheral zone of fitting in a scleral uh, lens so uh, the, the what can this bearing on the limbus cause it can lead to keratitis neovascularization as well as limbal stem deficiency already you know that the ocular surface integrity in um, uh, conditions which cause ocular surface disorders is compromised so you do not want to further compromise by causing a limbal uh, area which is uh, being uh, which has a heavy bearing in that region so what causes the uh, bearing of the scleral lenses on the limbal area? Basically, if you choose a lens which is uh, too small relative to the uh, diameter of the cornea that is being fit, that could be the main reason. And um, how do you notice uh, when the limbal area is compressed? You notice uh, with fluorescein as an area of paralimbal bearing or uh, best is to uh, witness it under an anterior segment OCT. That would give you a better picture of uh, whether there is a limbal bearing because uh, mostly when you talk about ocular surface disorders, we are going to be co-managing with ophthalmologists and in a setup where uh, we have access to OCTs and those devices which help us in um, fitting these devices too. So what is the solution when you notice that there is a limbal bearing is to choose the diameter of the scleral lens as such and by increasing the optic zone diameter, which will allow the scleral lens to adequately vault over the cornea, right? So basically uh, choosing the uh, diameter of the lens should be appropriate so that it vaults and does not cause any compression in the limbal area. And also the uh, like Kapritam mentioned, uh, what is the expected vault over the um, central zone in OSD cases, the goal for the initial clearance in the limbal zone should be around 100 to 150 microns. And after settling, you expect around 50 to 100 microns because we all know that scleral lenses, um, they start settling down further back over the cornea. So the initial clearance should be little more than what is expected so that after after the settling period of say between four to six hours, we have adequate clearance of around 50 to 100 uh, microns over the limbal area. So that uh, constitutes the um, you know transitional zone uh, clearance that you expect in a scleral lens fit, an ideal one rather. 
So Asif, if you can elaborate on uh, what are the uh, things that you would uh, expect in um, edge or the peripheral fit in scleral lenses? Yes, sure. Ma Thank you, ma'am. So uh, like uh, like you, you both have mentioned, like there is a need of central good central uh, fitting and uh, the good fitting in the limbal zone also. The same way the scleral area, the scleral zone is very important because as you know, all these lenses will go and go and land in that particular area in conjunctiva sclera. So proper alignment uh, of this scleral lens landing zone is very, very critical for a party of successful fitting. So in normal consideration is like if it is uh, 16 mm or less than that, so uh, the cost sclera will not be so so asymmetric like if you, if you consider the scleral profile. So in those, those cases, like less than 16 mm, we can go with a sp spherical landing zone. And uh, if, if we go a little bit larger, uh, more than away, away further, almost 15 or 16 mm in scleral, scleral area. So uh, it is more asymmetric. So which required a little bit of more advanced design, like toric landing zone design. But in case of ocular surface, surface condition, if we consider it is uh, already the surface is altered here and it's, it's more asymmetric than normal ocular surface and uh, uh, whatever the chord diameter it is either it is 15 or 20 so it this uh, this requires more alteration and modification in case of uh, ocular surface disorder cases so uh, again as you know the scleral profile the nasal part will be a bit flatter than the temporal part so lenses will have a tendency to go a little bit inferotemporal and acid so which can cause a little bit of disintegration and can cause some uh, impact on fitting and vision uh, related issues also but luckily this scleral lenses have a little bit of larger optic zone diameter which take care of these issues and uh, if you if you think other issues like sectorial or any localized conjunctival blanching uh, compression impingement staining so uh, that means that that particular area or meridian is like too steep and if the edge is lifting off or standing off that means that land landing zone area is too flat so it is very very important to um, evaluate this uh, landing zone so that we can be we can do with uh, slit lamp uh, microscope by using some fluorescent in that uh, edge area also and definitely like uh, anterior segment oc2 will be a very very good uh, tool to uh, evaluate that uh, and uh, and this poor alignments also can cause sometimes bit complications like discomfort debris accumulations and hypertrophy in long run in that particular structure so to overcome these issues maybe we can we can try some quadrant specific lens design or a lens with toric back surface periphery that can be used for a better fitting relationship and for that we have different lens manufacturing techniques which are usually sophisticated um, cat cam technology to improve the lens design and for fitting uh, proper alignment so uh, that can those lenses designs can be used and few special cases if you consider like uh, pingicula blape or glaucoma shunt uh, implant so in this type of cases the lens will have tendency to go and cause some blanching in that specific area and uh, area and cause some compression so uh, sometimes uh, reducing the lens diameter and avoiding that area could be one option a solution remedy for that or the second another thing could be give a larger diameter and to just fall that area and cover that area without compromising that area or that structure and a few cases a notch or localized area of interest elevation also also uh, has been proven very very helpful in that peripheral zone and and uh, as we have impression technology i think that is going to be the best option for this type of cases of ocular surface disorder where, uh, where the <coughs> ocular surface is uh, very very asymmetric and irregular so that molding and impression of this uh, lenses can be very very helpful in this type of cases uh, uh, um, also, so uh, hope. Uh, yeah. it is, yes. Uh, yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes. 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 So, can. Yeah. So uh, so now, as we know, like uh, the fitting uh, fitting part, and so I, I think we should we should go into that more, uh, another important part, like like sometimes after giving optimally fitted lenses also some patients will report back to clinic with some complaints like fogging or blooding of vision after a few hours of lens wire and when we evaluate them like we'll find some deposition in the lens surface with debris in the reservoir 
and uh, th that that is that becomes uh, bothersome sometimes so i would like to get some opinion from anita ma'am like what you recommend to manage this cases mostly the lens surface depositions uh, uh, if they come to you with this uh, surface deposition ka complaints so ma'am if you can so basically i have noticed that pre fit evaluation whether it is a regular case or a case with ocular surface disorders pre fit evaluation is very very important so uh, you end up getting cases with lens surface deposits uh, when uh, there is a co is existing ocular condition like a blepharitis or a meibomian plant disease if that has been neglected then that could be the cause of the you know uh, depositions on the anterior lens surface so uh, in patients with the um, osds with significant blepharitis we usually notice that the lenses are rapidly coated with the mucus filaments and lipophilic deposits so the lens surface could be contaminated also by hand cream or any cosmetic um, usage by the patients this is what we commonly come across as a reasons for uh, the anterior lens surface. is uh, deposits so basically what i noticed is uh, you use a conditioning solution which has uh, an ingredient like sodium hyaluronate which may be used to condition the lenses to clean the lenses as well as uh, use them to store the scleral lenses where and they make the uh, surface less attractive to deposits so that is uh, one thing and then you can choose a lens material which has a lesser wetting angle right and also now we have the uh, polyethylene glycol uh, based polymer coatings that are uh, the pec coatings that are available which can be added on to the uh, lens surfaces or we can order it separately when uh, the wetting issue persists so this treatment it what does does is it mimics the mucin layer of the tear film so it improves wettability at the same time it alleviates heavy deposition so peg uh, polymer based uh, coating is a solution again one thing that you need to note is if you've ordered for a um, polymer based coating you cannot use an alcohol based cleaner so it goes against it it doesn't serve the purpose so that needs to be uh, taken into account and most important though it is uh, taken to the last care and maintenance patient education is of great importance we fail to notice the importance of this aspect because all said and done we may be excellent practitioners um, giving the best of the uh, fitting for our patient doing the maximum customization possible to our patient but everything boils down to zero when a uh, care and maintenance is not properly explained to the patient and we notice that there is poor compliance from the patient's uh, point of view so non compliance is a biggest cause for dropouts and discomforts and uh, further uh, uh, rates of infections or you know any such um, conditions regularly that we notice not just with uh, patients with ocular surface um, disorders also uh, you need to regularly lubricate with non preserved uh, artificial uh, tears which can kind of help uh, dilute these um, deposits on the lens surface and also one more technique that can be employed is uh, you know when it's like you, it works like the car wipers you ask them to use a cotton uh, swab which is uh, dipped in a conditioning solution and kind of you know Uh, clean the front surface when the lens is in situ so it like how a car wiper would work so that is one solution that you can uh, think about to clear off uh, the anterior um, lens surface deposits yes thank you ma'am thank you for your input so i'll go to mr pritam now sir if you can tell about the um, reason behind the debris accumulation in the reservoir and how actually you tackle this this type of uh, Uh, debris uh, debris accumulation or turbidity in this area if you can give your inputs in that yeah but th i think along with this front surface deposit this is also a crucial element and this is typically known in the clinic as a mid day fogging so because after you put the contact lenses after a certain period of time patient will come revert back to you saying that the vision is not very clear and uh, so i have basically found two reasons in the clinic uh, why it happens one is when you sometimes that you see the lens edge that is obviously the debris is getting collected at the center but where is it coming from so typically sometimes most of the times that we see the lens edge somewhere at the edge either it is elevated or it is showing clear signs of elevation or the lens is moving indicating that the lens is loosely fit the periphery of the lens is not 
properly adhere to the ocular surface and through that gap over a period of time the debris because we are dealing with ocular surface disorder and uh, due to the lack of the tear that is available the the debris or the dirt that are getting accumulated they sort of get accumulated on the surface and slowly they sift through the periphery and they all get accumulated in the uh, come at the center and uh, and causes this problem at the same time another theory that uh, that most of the times as i said like we are dealing with ocular surface disorder and if we are dealing with an active inflammation then there are literature that has also suggested that there could be an accumulation of white blood cell they call it a partic particulate matter and when when that gets accumulated obviously that just enhances the or, or exaggerates the problem in that way now how to deal with that i i typically when i encounter this problem i typically look very carefully at the periphery at any point of time if there is a sign or a hint of elevation or a lift i try to uh, counter that i try to uh, correct that how do you do that you just deepen uh, the curvature at that point so when you do that obviously you get those lens edge or the periphery closer to the surface in that process you reduce the gap a little bit more obviously you have to be mindful when doing that you have to be mindful that you are not doing it too much because this conjunctiva is also, as i said we are this this is a condition where probably the conjunctival epithelium is also not very uh, not not very healthy and uh, when when if you are overdoing it probably that can cause a damage to the conjunctival epithelium but keeping that in mind if you are reducing that gap in the periphery of the lens you are going to cut down on the amount of debris that are going to get accumulated under the lens another thing that you can do as anika ma'am was alluding to uh, in the previous question that it's a, it's a co management thing you are uh, you know doing a management along with your ophthalmological league so when you do that obviously with a medic topical or an oral medication you are trying to reduce the uh, ocular surface inflammation in case you are dealing with an active inflammation so you are you, are, you also have to keep that in mind it's not only the lens uh, fitting that you have to uh, keep in mind but in case you are uh, in case you are uh, looking into that uh, in, in in so you have to also be mindful and uh, you have to control that inflammation as well in case you are doing both of this uh, keeping a check on the lens fitting as well as the management plan the the medication that is going on then we are doing good i think so most of in most part you will be able to handle that thank you thank you uh, mr bitham so i just additionally want to uh, mention to one more point like medications like ointments and gels so so these are also like uh, proved to be increase the likelihood of uh, surface deposition so altering this uh, overnight therapies like ointments or maybe gel which are a little bit of more viscous uh, can be helpful so we can we can shift those patient to water based products like drops or low viscous gel so which may reduce the surface deposition on the lens uh, um, in the morning and uh, definitely this this solution this should be a uh, preservative free and and one more thing like rinsing the ocular surface with non preserved saline upon waking may uh, remove the residue of ointments and gel so which also which also can be helpful for uh, this type of conditions and a uh, few few uh, scleral lens filling solutions also are available now like neutrophil lacrypure we can we can uh, mention so these are also has proved to be a little bit of more helpful in case of reducing reservoir debris because this this solutions don't have the, the electrolytes calcium or protein those are also responsible for this uh, liquid reservoir uh, debris formations and all uh, so so uh, i think uh, i should i should uh, come to that important part which is Uh, the patient compliance and the take uh, uh, care care regimen so i think if miss rino can add some points on the care and maintenance so which is the vital part of a successful contact lens wear okay so i'll add to what others said so the lens uh, that the patient is using it cannot be soaked in the saline overnight so that's the first thing that we have to tell them and the gp lens uh, usually the gp lens disinfectant and the solution that can that uh, can be used for daily cleaning and hydrogen peroxide disinfection is also like a good alternative but cannot be used for storage purposes and uh, rinsing uh, that's another uh, part of care and maintenance uh, rinsing with a conditioning solution as ma'am was discussing uh, we know the box sorry the boston simplex solution which is a conditioning solutions 
uh, can be used along with the non preserved uh, saline and coming to cleaning uh, use an alcohol based um, uh, intensive cleaners occasionally and as ma'am was uh, saying if you, if the if the lens is coated with a hydropec uh, coating then it is contraindicated so use an alcohol based intensive cleaners uh, especially for your ocular surface patients ocular surface disorder patients occasionally tell them to use it and excessive rinsing with a conditioning solution and a, a non preserved saline can improve the surface wettability and uh, uh now uh, so how frequently i can say once in a week uh, if they can or once in a month i would suggest uh, them to use an intensive cleaner which can actually remove the lipid or the protein depositions and uh, now various companies have come up with uh, uh, various activators and developers to uh, you know actually uh, do this process of intensive cleaning now i would also recommend uh, patients to wear eye goggles at least when they are going outdoor because if the lens surface is getting very dry then this uh, the eyelids will push uh, push the lenses down and you will actually see a blanching in the inferior conjunctiva right so uh, one more thing which i found during our practice is uh, like uh, we tested for the ph of the normal saline and we found it was 5.6 uh, is the ph of normal saline and over 6 hours of uh, wear and after remove after removing the lens after 6 hours we found it is around 7.2 but now various companies are coming with uh, saline solutions which which is like uh, with 7.2 ph so uh, uh, with the uh, boric acid in it which is again an anti inflammatory uh, uh, as a uh, component so uh, this may this may help uh, in maintaining the ph of the ocular environment uh, within the scleral lenses but i can't comment on that because we need some studies to actually uh, you know look into this area yeah that's what i wanted to say Okay, I think uh, that sums up well and uh, we will uh, very quickly uh, try and get to the last topic of discussion and I would, um, for which I would invite Asif and Preetam to very, very quickly um, uh, talk or take us through the recent advances in uh, specialty lenses uh, for ocular surface disorders. Yeah, Asif, you can start now. Asif, uh, okay, I think. Yeah, so uh, considering the scleral contact lens and ocular surface disorder, so I like to mention uh, the um, contact scleral lenses for the drug delivery system in ocular surface disorder. Like we can ap apply some one uh, one drop of uh, preservative free bevacizumab, which is an anti VGA, which will help uh, to reduce the corneal neovascularization. Um, we can we can mention impression technology, which is helping in case of very um, irregular ocular surface disorders. Um, we have the example is like iPrint Pro, which has uh, an tangible Hydra PEG that Anita Nam has already explained, which can be helpful in deposit resistance and profilometer, which is giving us a very good um, good uh, um, idea about the profile of corneal, limbal, and scleral area even more than beyond 20 uh, 20 mm scleral cord. So and it has some software also. So, which is helping in uh, contact lens fitting uh, as well. So, over to you, Mr. Preetam. Yeah, I think uh, so. What the two things that I want to share is the new thing that is coming up, or that has the work has been going on in the past decade. Is uh, one is the fact that it has nothing to do, by the way, uh, of the surface abnormality uh, uh, that that is of interest here. But one is the fact that we are. Uh, in, in, in a lab uh, which is which is located in US Berkeley uh, they are working on uh, aberration corrected uh, contact lenses and so basically what they do is they check the measure the uh, exact higher order aberration as well as lower order aberration and they sort of try to incorporate that on the front surface of the cornea uh, on the contact lens and they uh, so th and, and improve the visual quality to the maximum extent so that is something Sorry, that is something which is very uh, uh, interesting. At the same time, there is another group in uh, U uh, University of New South Wales that has been talk, you know, working on 
uh, the designs of myopia control it, similar sort of design that you know changing the curvature in the central and the mid peripheral part of the lens and by changing that they're trying to in, in, induce or uh, promote myopia control through the scleral contact lenses i think both of these are not market, available in the market at this point and still in under uh, research uh, uh, pr under research consideration so yeah these are the two things that are new and i found new in this topic Thanks, uh, Asif and Pritham. Due to a uh, paucity of time, we need to call this a wrap. Uh, so, for which I would like to invite Asif, if you can just um, take us through uh, the take-home uh, message from uh, today's uh, panel discussion. Yeah. So um, I'll be. So I'll be sharing uh, the take-home messages. So uh, you can follow the slides here. So. Um, as a specialty contact lenses, we can consider soft bandage contact lenses, corneal scleral and scleral contact lenses. And uh, so not only a particular area, like only central or limbal area, all, uh, all together, like central, limbal and peripheral, all should be considered as an optimal. That will That is a optimal fitting uh, all together. And front surface deposition can be taken care of by surface treatment, like treatment treating the meibomian dis dysfunctions and all. And proper cleaning is very, very important and should be emphasized very carefully to the patients. And properly fitted edge with toric periphery, reducing vault and midday removal and reinsertion with thorough cleaning is recommended uh, to manage the reservoir fogging, uh, which, is, um, um, which is very common in case of ocular surface disorder. So I would like to extend my uh, heartfelt thanks to our panelists for the wonderful discussion and great insight in the particular topic. I hope the practitioners and students listening to us today have also enjoyed and gathered knowledge and a rough idea about the specialty lens practiced in ocular surface disorders and hope you have got the answer for the uh, pre-test questions also. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, over to you, Aparna. Yeah. Thanks to all the panelists. That was a uh, need of the art topic. I speak on behalf of all the participants when I say that there was a lot of learning from that discussion. We have now come to the exciting part of the evening, a time to look back with admiration and a time to look forward with anticipation. The awarding ceremony. Two best e-posters and one best oral presentations will be awarded. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Narayanan will now announce the winners. Thank you, Aparna. Thanks again. And uh, thanks for giving the opportunity of uh, doing the um, most awaited session. As she mentioned already, there are there were 17 posters, out of which two best posters were selected. And out of the five oral presentation, one best presentation was selected by a panel of external and internal judges. I thank all the judges um, for their wonderful grilling work that they have done today. I am um, equally excited to inform you that uh, the certificate and the prize money of 10,000 rupees would be awarded to each of these winners. So, um, under the e-poster category, how much I miss the thunderous applause and the uh, packed audience. The e-poster comparison of visual performances of two different multifocal contact lens and modified monovision and presbyopic people by Mr. Asif Iqbal Shankar Netralia for the best e-poster category. Congratulations, Asif. Um, at the um, next best e-poster another best poster to again win an award money of 10,000 and a certificate from the Medical Research Foundation belongs to Ms. Akshaya Balakrishnan of Elite School of Optimistry. I, I can hear the uh, big round of applause. The other audience, you can pour in a big round of messages in the chat box and encourage these winners. And um, 
coming to the oral presentations the presentations were judged by eminent and really tough judges how many questions my god they grilled them to the core and the winner is ms pooja nandagopal on top not be too soft from the manipal college of health professions congratulations to all the winners and uh, thank you so much thanks aparna Congratulations to all the participants and winners. We have now come to the end of the session. Thank you everyone for joining us and making this virtual session a great success. We look forward to meeting you next year on the same day, either virtually or in person. We will be sending your e-certificate of participation through email. Thank you once again. I now request Mr. Abdul Majid, Senior Optometrist at Contact Lens Department, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, sir, you are on mute. Thank you, Aparna. Good evening to Honorable and our most distinguished Chief Guest of the Day, Professor Edward Bennett, our respected Director, Administration of Medical Research Foundation, Ms. Akila Ganeshan, Honorable Speaker, and everyone gathered here. It's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks and acknowledge mm -hmm. the contributions of those who work really hard to make this scientific session a resounding success. On behalf of Medical Research Foundation, first of all, I extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest, Professor Edward Bennett, who has spared his precious time from his various schedule to grace today's occasion. Thank you, sir. For today, we had an opportunity to hear your thought-provoking lecture, which has enlightened our minds and has shown us a new path. This will surely be going to encourage us in a future event. I would like to express my profound gratitude to our respected director administration, Ms. Akila Ganeshan, for her unwavered and catalytic initiative to go ahead with the first and virtual Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan Memorial Scientific Session. I would like to extend my special thanks to our former principal of Elite School of Optometry, Dr. Krishna Kumar, for sparing his time for presenting a motivating an inspiring model for an integrated automatic practice. My gratitude to all the speakers and as well as panel members for gracing the occasion and giving excellent presentations and sharing their opinion today. I would like to thank profoundly all the delegates who have taken part in today's scientific session out of their biggest occupation. I'm happy to express my whole heartfelt look to our contact team for the tremendous efforts for the direction of today's Dr. Rajeshwari Mahadevan Memorial Scientific Session. Finally, I would like to thank our event management, multimedia and web development department for their immense contributions behind the scene for making today's scientific session a huge success. Thank you so much. Once again, I, I thank you all for being with us this evening. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. That's a wrap. Thank you so much, everybody.